Uh, the vice president said, quote, I did not know that the money was being contributed at the time. The people with me did not know. Obviously, something, someone did not handle it right. Now, is that true? Did none of the people that were accompanying the president, uh, like uh, Don Fowler or David Strauss, did any, or, or yourself, I mean, didn't any of them know that money was uh, being collected? The, to answer your question, it's not true. Uh, I believe Mr. Fowler knows about that, and also Mr. Strauss probably knew about that as well. So they knew it was a fundraiser. You knew it was a fundraiser. Maria Shaw knew it was a fundraiser. Don Fowler knew it was a fundraiser. But the vice president who was with all of you did not know it was a fundraiser. Mr. Chairman, I can only state the Mr. Fowler knows about it, knew about it, and, and uh, Mr. Strauss knew about it. I really can't say anything further about or what more than that. When you talked to the Justice Department, did they ask you if any of the contributors got special treatment at the temple? Did they ask you if they got special seating? Did the Justice Department ask you that? I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I did remember I went over the seating charts with the Justice Department for the detail. Did they ask you mm -hmm. if the people who contributed got special seating? I think they asked everyone who uh, no, I could identify it. But did they ask you if people who contributed got special seating? Some yes, but some of the people did not even contribute to also there. But the Justice Department did ask you if the people, but the Justice Department did ask you if there was special seating for the contributors. Mr. Chairman, it might not be exactly words what you're saying, but who, I was asked, who are these people, why they were sitting there? Did you, what did you tell them? What did you tell the Justice Department? If, whatever the truth was, is the, for instance, some of the distinguished guests. Now, the, all the guests is not necessarily sitting on the ta table or designated by me. Now, what, what I want to ask is this. 
when the Justice Department asked you who these people were there and why they were there, did you say these people in the front row or these people were contributors? Did you tell them that? What did you tell the Justice Department? Not all of them. Some of them were. Did you tell the Justice Department that? I believe I did. You did tell the Justice Department I I did, yes. that some of the people listed when they asked you about it were? Contributors uh, or potential contributors. If I might ask one follow-up question real quickly. Was that in the 302s? We'll, we'll check that out. Thank you. Sure. Um, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Wong, um, you've been asked this over and over again. There was a fundraising event that was canceled, and then there was a community event at the temple. And as much as the chairman would like to make you say it was a fundraising event, it's your testimony that it wasn't a fundraising event. He may not believe you, but it just seems to me to ask the question over and over again to try to make you say something that you don't want to say is going too far, it's asking the question over and over and over again. Now, I, I don't know what to make of the fact that if, there, if people were contributing, and then they were going to, and they were going to contribute to go to a fundraiser that was canceled, but they contributed for that fundraiser, and then they went to the community event, why they shouldn't be give, given any kind of prominent attention. Were people given prominent attention, as you indicated, who didn't give any money? I don't think Mr. Kanabi, Don Kanabi, the supervisor, gave any money. He was a very prominent figure who was sitting on the head table as well. He happens to be also be a Republican, as best I know. Right. So I I I, uh, I don't see what the what, what what we're getting into by having the chairman ask you this question over and over again. It seems to me almost the point of uh, certainly redundancy, but almost uh, harassment. Uh, your testimony is that there was a community event at the Shilai Temple, and there was another fundraising event, but the fundraising event was canceled. Is that is that an accurate statement? That is correct. Mr. Waxman, through all these exercises we just did uh, a little bit earlier, to, to, be, to be fair, now we're not, I would not deny there is some checks being collected you know, through such a, such a process there. Uh, I mean, through this event, I'm talking about afterwards or before to that. Uh, we certainly did not collect any money over, you know, right at that, that, that site. By the way, um, the chairman asked you about the questions from the Justice Department. These were FBI inquiries, weren't they? Yes. Largely. Largely, largely related to that, yeah. So, uh, because as I understand that you were interviewed by the FBI about all these questions, and the chairman asked you, were you asked by the Justice Department whether some of the contributors were at the head table? That, that question would have come from the FBI agents in the interview, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, no. Because you were interviewed by both the FBI and Justice? That's correct, yes. Simultaneously. 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 Yes. So, so different people at the, at the questioning would be FBI and different others were Justice and they would take, eat, take turns asking you questions or they were all asking you questions uh, at the same time? Well, um, mostly it was. I think most of it were coming from the FBI, though. It was one meeting, just that's correct. And They're FBI all sitting on one table, and, and, that, and, that different and different men, people there were asking questions. That's correct. And you didn't ask now that questions from the man from the Justice Department or that questions from the employee of the FBI. No, he responded to the question. That's right, sir. Well, I. Uh, I just want to clarify that point. I have some time left over. I'll be pleased to uh, yield it to Mr. Shays. He's here to pursue questions, and he can add it on to his round. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, the, um, 
I, actually, I'll take my own time. I appreciate that, but I'll take my own five minutes. And um, Well, then I'll yield back the balance of my right. time. Thank you. It's just that this way I control the time, and I appreciate that. Um, and, and it relates to this issue. Uh, I don't think the chairman was badgering you at all. I think he was trying to understand something. I learned something new that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy he asked the question. Um, what I learned was that some money was collected before and some money was collected after. I also learned that you told uh, Mr. Gore's uh, people, the people that were with him, that there was going to be a certain area in which financial contributors or potential financial contributors were going to sit. Isn't that true? That's true. Okay. So you weren't badgered. You told us something that I didn't know, and I don't think the committee knew, and maybe the public didn't know. No. See, I have two ways to view, view Mr. Gore's uh, issue. I can view him that he is extraordinarily incompetent, so are his people, to have him go to an event that's a major fundraising event, and he didn't know it, or that he knew it and found himself in a very awkward situation. Maybe he wasn't happy about it at the end, but it was, in fact, an event. It's kind of like when Mr. Mr. Gore made calls from public buildings, and he said, well, there's no controlling authority. It, it was an embarrassing event. He knew it shouldn't have happened. And by saying no controlling authority, he was probably implying that it was soft money, therefore it might be legal because soft money is not called campaign money. But then the DNC and others uh, rerouted the funds to, um, to hard money contributions that then did make it illegal. Um, now, there was an article in the New York Times um, of June 12th, and um, the article, what I want to read you, it says, and White House aides, speaking of this event, are now upset that the reimbursement scheme will be a central point of the prolonged criminal investigation and prevent, permit, prevent Mr. Gore from putting the episode behind him. Officials at the Democrat National Committee said this week that they also felt betrayed by Mr. Wong's varying accounts of the event, especially after questions were first raised about its propriety last fall. He kept insisting it was just community outreach and that he had never, ever billed it as a fundraiser, said one Democrat official who insisted on anonymity. anonymity. And of course, that is far from the truth. We just felt, feel completely misled by him. Evidently, Republicans aren't allowed to criticize you, but Democrats are. Um, was this a fair uh, criticism of you? The answer is no. Right, because if, in fact, if you had misled them, you would have been breaking the law and you would have been disagreeing with the very thing that you told us you hadn't. You hadn't stopped breaking the law after 94. So I'm going to, to as, as you know, my distinguished ranking member is willing to give you the credibility to say you're under oath and you're telling us the truth. And you've told us the truth. They were informed. They knew it. So the only thing we have going now is you didn't directly tell the president, vice president, directly. Is that true? You didn't speak to the vice president? Absolutely not. So you didn't tell the vice president, but you told his people. Is that true? Or his people knew about it, yes. The same, yeah. OK. Anything else? To me. Happy to yield. The, the point that I think you're missing is that Mr. Wong said the event was not a fundraising event. And I wanted to point that out to you. So I yield back. Is that what you said? It is not a fundraiser? Could I, um, Mr. 
Wong, I just want to say to you, um, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I don't want Mr. Waxman to put the words in your mouth. But um, I, I, I am going to demand that we be precise in this in, in every instance. I was trying to say, is, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shays. At a time, because I planned the fundraiser, but the, fundraiser, the fundraising event was canceled, the place was canceled. So trying to, the, the event over there, in my mind, that was not really a fundraiser. We did not really collect the money, trying to, did not even have people stay in the front to collect money. However, you know, with all these months, years going on, you know, I was not really, you know, sure, you know, that. I, I'm uneasy by your response. I feel you're giving us two answers. And I've asked the chairman, my time's run out. Could I have a little bit of your time just to pursue this? Yes. Yes, so I'll yield to uh, Mr. Uh, when, when, when that's over, but just, I still, you know. You may have my time when yours is over. Thank you. You know, this is getting into a legal definition on that. At the time, it was not really my thinking. Right now, I'm not really sure, you know, how it's being categorized. It has to be done okay. through legal terms, you know. Okay, let's, let's be real clear then. And I, I, I was really eager to go on to something else, but you testified to the chairman uh, that money was raised before the event and after the event, correct? That's right. Yes. Okay. You also testified to the chairman that you let people know in, in the uh, vice president's entourage that there was a certain area in which uh, f uh, contributors were sitting and uh, both who had contributed and potential contributors. Is that not correct? That is correct. Okay. And it would be unfair for anyone in the president's entourage, vice president's entourage to mischaracterize uh, that confusion. You did do that. That's, that's correct, yes. And this, in fact, was a fundraising event. money was raised. Well, I had a difficulty, you know, in drawing lines that were shared on that. But it, in fact, was a fundraising event. Isn't that no, correct? There was money, whether before or after being raised, yes. You know, I, I go to fundraising events, the money comes in before, it comes in after, but while I'm speaking, they don't hand out the money. Before you answer, Mr. Wong, I also want to say your job at the DNC was fundraising. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. That was your job, and you were doing your job. Right. Someone criticizing you, um, Democrats, for this confusion, I think you might have been criticized unfairly. What is your answer? To your fir earlier questions? Yes. Was this okay. a fundraiser event? I'm not really in the position trying to argue with you, your points, uh, Congressman Shea. I want to state that there's money being collected prior to the event and also the, the money being collected after the event. And, but there's no, based on my knowledge, there's no money collected at the event. Now, at the time, I think is the, the whole event, the mostly happened was in the front part. That a lot of people coming to welcome him. You know, it's just, it was, in my view, it's just a community, you know, based the event. Is it true that some people came to the vet uh, expecting that they should make a contribution? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I, I want to ask you this. Anyone... Um, 
prior to your testimony, asked you to not characterize this as a campaign or event or a fundraising event? Uh, nobody, nobody. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I, I have another line of questioning, but I'll, I'll yield back my, my time on this. Mr. Waxman. Just to put this whole thing to rest, there was a fundraising event scheduled. Money was being collected for that fundraising event. That fundraising event, no, without a doubt, a fundraising event, it was an event to raise money exclusively, was canceled. And some of the people who were going to come to the first event joined with other people in the Shilai Temple community event. Is that, is that exactly where things That's are? That's correct, sir. So now, whether the Shilai event was a fundraising event seems to me something that Mr. Shays and Mr. Burton are trying to put into your mouth. If an event is a, an event for the purposes of raising money, that's a fundraising event, as was the event that you were working on that was canceled. People can go to a, a community event and when they go to the community event, you as a fundraiser or any of us as candidates trying to raise money might talk to people before the event and after the event and urge them to give money, but it doesn't make it an event, a community event, a community meeting doesn't become a fundraising event because there may be fundraising before and after that event. That is correct. I just want to pin that down and I hope we put this issue to rest um, and uh, I have no other questions so I'm going to yield back the balance of my time and maybe we can move on with and get into other areas and complete this uh, very very lengthy interrogation of you. Mr. Chairman, could you just yield to me a second? I'll be glad to yield to my colleague. Uh, I just, uh, we want to put it to rest. I don't understand why you said yes. He said it doesn't make it a fundraising event. Doesn't the fact that you raise money at the event make it a fundraising an event? It may mean that you, for some reason, didn't think of it as a fundraising event, but the dang thing was a fundraising event. He just he at the event. He the just didn't has know. He, has time. he just didn't know. Uh, the president saying he didn't know it was a fundraising event. Mr. Chair, it's, it's very, very difficult for me to, to answer that. You know, I... It wasn't difficult for you to answer, Mr. Waxman. You seemed very quick to answer that, and that's what concerned me. If you had hesitated and said, well, Mr. Waxman, this part is true, this isn't. But you were really willing to just say yes to his entire statement. And uh, that's what concerns me. It seems like you're confl you have uh, conflicting testimony before us. You see, as the, as the times goes on, you, you, you're thinking back on this scene. You so I wasn't sure about my state of mind at that particular time. That's what I want to really want you to say. He was talking about your state of mind. He was talking about whether it was a fundraising event or not. It turned out it was. The question is, did he know it or not? And then Mr. Mr. Uh, Burton uh, gave every indication that he should have known because you had people sitting in the event who had contributed uh, for this event and others who were going to contribute because of the event. It's about as big an example as a fundraiser you can get. No, we're not. Oh, he yielded his time back. Okay. Congressman Shea, I, I can understand that the different perspective that people may view this as a fundraising or not fundraising event on that. In my mind, at that time, this basically was a community event because Mr. Gore was so much welcomed by the community people and then going in, you know. Uh, well, I, I, I have this time, and I'll just say to you, it is true you testified that you let the White House know that you wanted a section 
of people to sit who were contributors and potential contributors to this event. That is correct. Absolutely right, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I, I, I don't want to uh, prolong this. I think the record will speak for itself. But I want to make sure that we nail one point down, and that is that the people with Vice President Gore clearly knew that money was being contributed. Mr. Fowler did, you said. Mr. Strauss did, you said. You did, and Maria Shaw did. And you stated that very clearly, and I just want to make sure that's clearly stated for the record. I believe they knew the money had been contributed prior to the event, and I also knew the money being collected after the event. That's, that's a statement I want to address to Mr. Chairman on that. Okay. Now, uh, during the Senate hearings on this matter, there was testimony that a number of the temple uh, nuns uh, and uh, monks destroyed and altered records once news stories about the event became public. Do you have any knowledge of uh, this beyond the press reports? Did you, anybody talk to you about them destroying documents? Or no, not? Mr. Chairman. Had nothing to do with nothing it? Nothing to do Didn't with know this. anything about that? I did not know anything about it, sir. Did you uh, ever talk to Maria Shaw about that, uh, about uh, those documents being destroyed, or should she talk to the people at the temple about having them destroyed? No, not on this subject, no. Were you ever in contact with Maria Shaw or staff about uh, how to respond to press inquiries about the uh, Shai Lai uh, Temple, uh, uh, Shai Temple event? No, sir. Were you ever in contact with Maria Shaw or staff or anyone from the Shai Lai uh, Temple about destroying or altering evidence? I think you've already answered that. You said no. No, sir. On June the 10th, 1996, there was a fundraiser at the home of uh, Lou Wasserman in California. Uh, did you help organize that event? June the 10th, 1996. Yes, it was at Lou Wasserman's home. Uh, I do know Mr. Wasserman, but I don't re remember I ever set foot in that one, though. And so you don't recall soliciting any money for that event? Mm. Let me see. I, I just need to have a little more information to make sure. Why don't you look at Exhibit 439? Okay. Exhibit 439. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Exhibit 439. Is this pronounced Zhao Ming? Johnny Chung's there, so you weren't there. No. Thank you. Allow me to read that the things. I did not plan that event. It was not hosted by me, and I believe I was there. You, you were there? I was there, yes. Did you solicit, solicit any money for that event? I think there might be some checks being contributed to there. Uh, I think Congress La Tourette's or uh, Congressman Sauter was talking about, remember, the, some of the checks I had control in my hand, some of the part of might have a part of those money going to DNC. But I mean, did you solicit that money or were you just a recipient of it? Did you just receive it? No, the, the check space, it was in my control. I know, but I mean... Whoever yeah. went to that event, I just, you know, executed and give the money to the DNC. I see, but did you solicit the money? Did you ask for the money? From other people? Uh-huh. 
Uh, did no. you did you ask people to contribute to the to the event? Except those uh, that particular item, no. Okay. You and the Riyadis were there. Is that correct? That is correct. Why were the Riyadis uh, at that event in the U.S. and did they travel to the U.S. with uh, Zhao Ming Dai? No. They came by themselves. They came by themselves, I believe. Exhibit 440, which is right next to that, is a commit list for the June 10th event. On page two of the exhibit, you're listed as pledging $10,000 for the event. Is that accurate? And if so, did you play, pledge to raise that, or did you just contribute it yourself? I was not contributing myself. I just used the money that I had a control on. The, remember the checks I told you, that you used that as a contribution. I see. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman passes. Let me go ahead and uh, conclude, and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Shays. On page four of that exhibit, uh, there, it lists the Riyadis as having pledged $15,000 for that event. Did the Riyadis pledge to uh, give money to that event? Did no. They, they did not pledge to give money to that event? No. Why does it say that? I, I, I wouldn't know. Because, the, Mr. Chairman, I mentioned to you there is a 25,000 a 25, checks probably was given for that event. That probably explained to you one is 10, the other one is 15, total was 25. So 10 was coming from you and 15. Well, but but where did the 25 come from? Who was that? Who did that come from? From uh, Arif. Remember, Arif of Soraya. Remember, I, I have a control on the checks in hand. I just pick. So you attributed that to you and to the Riyadis? That is but, correct. But, but you didn't give or the Riyadis didn't give? That is correct. So it was somebody else's money, but you, it was given in their name? That is correct. Well, given in whose name? No. That's not right. That's not right. Huh? Staff just informed me that the the Wariata Donata's money was pledged the day before at another event and not for this event. So where did the ten and fifteen thousand dollars come from if it was not from no, my my recollection is I did not have any other control of the money except the Soraya or Arif's. Well we'll have to check that because it Yeah, I'd like to know. I'd certainly would like to explain to you a question as well and fully. If, if there is any information, I'll be glad to explain well, that. We will. We'll, we'll, we'll look it up. Um, so it's... Uh, well, it, uh, oh, I Mr. think it... Mr. Chairman? Let, let me just... Just one second, please. Okay. Yeah, here we have a, an event for uh, Diane Feinstein for Senator. And uh, the check from the Where Donatas was June the 5th for $25,000, and it shows that money going to the Diane Feinstein event. So the event at Lou Wasserman, which was the next day, or well, well this, was, this check was dated the 5th, and the event was the 9th, so the next day on the 10th, there was another fundraiser at the home of Mr. Wasserman's, and uh, the 25,000 from the Weary Donatas went to Diane Feinstein's event, so where did the 10,000 from you and the 15,000 from the Riyadis come from at Wasserman's? My best recollection is I did not give the money 10,000 or 15,000. Mr. Riyadi did not give that money either. My best recollection is that was the Will Dinada's money. So Whether it's the Soraya's or Arif's because they, both of them were giving the checks in my control. It could be one from Arif, the other one coming from Soraya on that basis. They both gave 25? So they each gave 25,000. And what you're saying is that it may have been his money that was given at this other one instead of hers, right? My best recollection, that m might have been the case right now. Right? We'll, 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 we'll check that. What? Yeah. Why, why, why was Riyadi's name on anybody's list. I mean, why did you show that the Riyadis gave 15000 Because they weren't eligible to give at all. 
Why, why would you, why, I mean, even if it wasn't their money, why would you put the money in their name if they were not eligible? I think the list is indicating is reality attended. I don't know why being interpreted, you interpreted as is that they were giving the money though. I'll get back to that uh, later. We're going to talk this over. And I don't want to bother you with it at this point. Is there, what else do we have? Would you would you like to take a break for about ten minutes? Would you feel that you need that? No, I'm I'm okay, Mr. Chairman. Anybody else need to take Shea. a break? What? Shea. If not, if not, we'll press ahead, Mr. Shays, uh, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Shays, did you want to go ahead? Thank you. I'll yield you the rest of my time, and then you can have yours. Thank you. Um, we're not at the temple now. We're back at. Uh, we're back um, trying to understand the U.S. Thai Business Council meeting. And um, Mr. Rothkoff, either in a deposition or testimony before the Thompson Commission, testified that neither he nor Under Secretary Carton nor Sandy Kristoff, who was uh, National Security Council, supported launching the U.S. Thai Business Council from the White House with the President attending. Yet the event did, in fact, take place in the White House, and the President did attend. Isn't that correct? My recollection, it, it probably happened just briefly, yes. Yeah, and the President did attend that event. My recollection is. Uh, do you attribute the success of that, that event in part to your efforts? I don't think so, I don't, no. I don't mean it sarcastically, I mean it. Sincerely. No, I, I don't think so. Did you keep, um, Pauline uh, Kachanilak uh, apprised of your efforts during that, you know? If I did the Moses, I just sent a memo to Mr. Roscoff. That's all I did. Right, but you were in contact with her. I mean, that, that part's true. Right. Um, do you know if Ms. Uh, Kachanilak was in contact with anyone at DNC regarding this event? She might have, but I don't know who she did, though. Okay. Um, now, the event took place on October 6, um, do you think it's a coincidence that I'll give you my time, Mr. Rashes. Thank you. Do you think it's a coincidence that Mrs. Uh, uh, Chanelak's sister-in-law, Georgie Cronenberg, contributed 12500 to the DNC? I would have no knowledge on that. Do you think it would be a coincidence that uh, 14 days later, Mrs. Kachanilak uh, contributed 32500 to the DNC. Again, I would not know. Are you aware of any government official that, besides yourself, who thought this was a smart thing for the president to do? Uh, I do know about anyone else, though, besides myself, who wrote the memo. Um, let me um, get to uh, questions on security, which we kind of touched on. and. I'd asked you yesterday, um, and, and, I, and I'm going to say to you uh, again, I did go to the committee, the Cox Committee, and I didn't find anything that would have been more damning than their statement. And frankly, there wasn't a lot of support material uh, as it relates to uh, everything is a coincidence. It's speculation on what you had clearance, you were friends with the Riottis, and so on, and you had contacts. That's the, the extent of it. Um, we have, we have no damning memos there, nothing that, that, that would, would, uh, uh, could be used, uh, to my knowledge. I didn't see any material. Um, but uh, what was of interest to me was that you had stated that, um, that you really didn't have any interest in this, in having a clearance. Um, is that correct? I think yes. Which clearance? That wasn't Which clearance? Hmm? Hmm? No, which clearance? You knew you had to have for, for your job. But you the, the, the clearance uh, to get my job, probably that clearance has to be done, though. But you had an interest because you had to do it for your job. But you, so you got it because that's what the job required you to have. You needed the clearance to do your job. Is that what your testimony is? Yeah, that's what I understood, yes. So, you were given an inter interim top secret, then you were given a full top secret, and you did not ask for the SCI, the, and, and, you know, the compartmentalized um, aspect of, of security. Um, 
it's um it's of interest to me that um you were briefed 37 times by dickerson and your your um uh and he estimates that you saw between 10 and 15 pieces of intelligence per briefing or uh, what he refers to as 370 to 550 separate pieces of intelligence. And he, we attribute, it's called the great bulk of the material that you saw was what we call field reporting, and I use the word raw intelligence. And this type of intelligence is considered extremely sensitive, mostly because it contains sources and methods. Now, the, the feeling I get to date is that you had these briefings, but they didn't interest you all that much. Is that correct? I shouldn't say I was not interested in it. That's part of my job, and, and, and I have to read them. You got your top secret briefing on October 25th, 1994. You had been uh, working there for how long by then? October 24, 1994. That will be around three months. Okay, it was, it was the 25th, but, it, but in other words, October 94. Right. About three months, sir. Uh, and you were already testified before this committee that you, the SCI clearance, you declined. Um, I speculated that you might have declined because there might have been further investigation of your background and you might have been concerned that they might look at the illegal contributions to the realities. Is that a factor? That is not a factor, sir. No. Um, and you were briefed regularly about every two weeks you received a briefing. That's what it amounted to? Approximately by, mainly by Mr. Dickerson, I believe. And that's the Office of Intelligence Liaison? That is correct, sir. Did you ever sit down with Charles Meisner or any of your superiors at ITA and discuss what your intelligence briefing should cover? Um, Mr. Shea, so basically, the way it went was uh, Mr. Meisens would, would process the clearance for me, and later on, Mr. Dickinson would like to, uh, was asking me what area of in, you know, you'd be interested to know. Okay. Um, wouldn't he have tried to tell you the kind of areas that you should know based on the, your job responsibilities? Well, the areas I'll, I'll be interested in, yes. Now, when I say the area is interesting, that Mr. Meisner basically have some informal, uh, not assignment, Tom, a division in internal territory. With his background basically was in Europe, South America, in particular in Japan. And he was working with World Bank before working on Japan. He used to be a banker uh, and also State Department official previously. He thought, you know, I have quite a few years in Asia, and then I will cover the Asia. So we we'll both will be able to have a, cover most of, if not all, the territory in the world. So the Asia basically, except probably Japan, was uh, was uh, was assigned to me. Okay, I'll go through these questions when my time comes back. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Wong, did you have any ulterior motive in getting a clearance or not getting a clearance? No. And uh, did you do anything improper with any information you received as a result of get, getting it because you had a clearance? No, sir. I guess that's really what we want to know. I asked that you answered it. That's right. What we're doing now is going through a lot of elaboration. I I'm sorry, can you hear the gentleman? I said that's the essential question that we want to know, and we've, I've asked it and he's answered, and everything else seems to be uh, uh, dancing around that issue. W w would the gentleman yield? You want me to yield to you? Sure. Just, just to, um, are you suggesting I shouldn't be asking these questions? I'm not making any suggestion. I wanted to get this on the record. That's my okay. question of Mr. Wong. Uh, if the gentleman would further yield, um, I know a person can say yes or no. I just want to know the particulars to be able to judge the validity of his answer. He is a convicted felon in front of us. 
So just because he said he didn't do something uh, illegal uh, doesn't mean I should say okay. I happen to think you're a very good man, but I want to ask these particular questions, and I, I thank the gentleman for letting me make that well, point. Well, I want the gentleman from Connecticut to know I'm not questioning his motives. I wanted to get this question <clears throat> on the record and answer it on the record, and that's exactly what we've done, and I think that's the essential question that we need to know about. Did, did he get a security clearance because of some ulterior motive? And his answer is no. No. And did he get some information because of, a, of uh, the clearance that he acted improperly with? And his answer is no. No. I yield back the balance of my time. Um, let me uh, just follow up on that real briefly. Uh, I think all of us have had staff members try to get clearances because it's very important that we keep uh, government secrets and classified information classified. And it takes three, four, five, six months. I've had some people go seven months and longer because it just, you have to, the FBI has to question them. They have to go out in the hinterlands and ask their neighbors, find out what their background is, all kinds of things. Mr. Wong didn't go through any of that. Zippo. And I think that's why Mr. Shays is asking those questions. Why was there special treatment given for the security clearance for Mr. Wong. Now let me go on to this Riotti thing real quickly. The Weir Donatas, who were not well off, at least from the appearances here in the United States, did have a wealthy father, at least his uh, Miss Weir Donata did, Hashim Ning. He wired illegally $450,000 to them to give to the DNC. Uh, they gave that money through you, Mr. Wong, much of it, to the DNC. Now, in the DNC records, and I bring your attention, I'd like to uh, call your attention to, uh, what page is that? 444. 444. Exhibit 440, yes, Exhibit 440. It says clearly let me have my papers back there. It says clearly that uh, Aileen, Aileen and James Riotti pledged $15,000. Now, this was under your watch, and you no longer were, you say, taking illegal contributions. But it does show that they made that kind of a pledge, and you're saying that the Weir Donatas gave that money, and you just divvied it up between the 10000 that was attributed to you and the 15000 attributed to them. The records don't show that. The records show that the Riottis pledged and gave $15,000. Now that needs to be clarified. That needs to be clarified. Because they were not legally entitled to give that money. So you know the burden of proof is on you to show that they didn't give that money. You said that the money came from the Weir Donatus, which was illegal in the first place. Well, again, the report, Mr. Chairman, was, was not my report, it's number one. Well, And then the report, if I can read the report, it say they did not really give money. Not, nothing being received by them, though. Yes, that's right, it says it was pledged. There's no money being received. They didn't contribute money, though. What's that? Documents yeah, th this document is dated June the 3rd before the event. Do we have documents after that? Okay. We don't have the documents after that. We'll check that. Let me go on to another subject, okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you take part in a DNC trip to Asia and Hawaii in December of 1991? I did go to Taiwan and Hong Kong, but I did not go to Hawaii. Okay. Did the Justice Department ask you any questions about that trip when they interviewed you? We're talking about 91, that trip. Yes. No. They did not. Do you know who asked you to participate in that trip? I believe I was invited by, um, to come along by, um, Melinda Yee at that time. Melinda Yee? Yeah. She was over at the DNC. She was over in DNC. Do you remember what the purpose uh, of that DNC trip was to Asia? I think it, uh, 
then Chairman Ron Brown was making a trips over to uh, to uh, Taiwan and, and Hong Kong. Uh, exhibit 11 shows the DNC's budget for the trip. It says the Lippo Bank is pay paying for the DNC's hotels, meals, and transportation in Hong Kong. Did you arrange for the Lippo Bank to pay for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that was, that was the Lippo Group. It was not Lippo Bank, by the way. Well, it was the Lippo Group. Did, did, did you, group. Did you yes, arrange? Yes, I did arrange that. You arranged for them to pay for that? To take care of the, the hotels and, yeah, and transportation. Mr. Shays uh, has the time now. He would like to take a 10 to 15 minute break. So we'll take a break now and uh, we'll be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. All right, okay. Chair stands in recess. Thank you. Chris? I think they were invited by KMT. Here's a look at what's ahead on C-SPAN 2. First, we'll show you the final two and a half hours of today's House hearing on political fundraising. Then at about 3.10 a.m., the National Association of Manufacturers reviews its key policy issues of 1999 and outlines its priorities for 2000. Then at 4.10 a.m., the Close-Up Foundation looks at U.S. trade and the World Trade Organization. This weekend, on Book TV's history program, author James Lowen discusses his book, Lies Across America, What Our Historic Sites Get Wrong, an investigation of the history behind monuments and commemorative markers, houses, and ships in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. This Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. 48 hours of nonfiction books, all weekend, on TV. Book TV, on C-SPAN 2. For a complete program schedule, simply go to booktv.org. Next, the final two and a half hours of the House Government Reform Committee's hearing on political fundraising. Democratic Party fundraiser John Huang has been the only witness questioned by the panel today. Uh, when you went to uh, Hong Kong, you said you arranged for the Lippo Bank to pay for uh, the hotels, meals, and transportation for the DNC's uh, group, right? Lippo Group, yeah. Lippo, Lippo group. group, right. In 91. Right. Did you agree to raise money for the DNC while in Hong Kong? I did not promise that, no. You did not promise that. Did you, were you asked about it? I would, I would ask my colleague to, you know, invite some businessmen. I was not asked, uh, you know, to do that. I did not promise that. Did you ask anybody to raise money? No. You didn't ask for any contributions? No. Okay. Exhibit number 109. That exhibit is a memo from Melinda Yee to DNC Chairman Ron Brown. Uh, Ms. Yi said you offered to host an event in Hong Kong with a goal of $50,000. Is that correct? The memo indicated that way. I did not really offer that $50,000. Why would she say that, I wonder? I don't know. She was an official at the DNC at the time, wasn't she? I believe she was working on Asian American, uh, Asian American, Asian Pacific American Affairs for uh -huh. DNC. For the DNC. That's and correct. And she was involved in fundraising. 
I'm not sure she was or not, but yeah, at least on the political side she was. But that memo to uh, Ron Brown from Melinda Yee says that you offered to host an event in Hong Kong for 50000 and you're saying that's not true. I never promised that. I would oh, no, 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 I know, no. You never promised that. Did you say that you would consider it? Did you say you would do it? She has proposed that I, would, I could, could do that. And I what said, did you say? I said, no, I could not promise you on that. And I would run up some businessmen to welcome, welcome Chairman uh, Brown at that time to come over and have a lunch and dinner meeting with the people, have him speak at this event. That's about all. I could not really, you know, promise to, to so, raise any money. So did you say anything like, well, I can't promise I'll raise 50000 but I'll get a group of men together that you can talk to? Something in that line, yes. But the indication was that you might be able to raise some money from them. I believe that's a hurry interpretation, but deep, deep down in my, in my mind, I was never, never committed. You did not commit, but you did get the people together? I did arrange it because there's a chairman of the Democratic Party was there, certainly, you, yes. When you arranged it, did, uh, did, uh, did they raise any money at that event? Not that I know of, sir. Not what? Not that I don't know of. I don't think in Hong Kong they raise any money. So no money was raised. They got the people together that you said you would get together, and she wanted to raise $50,000, but to your knowledge, no money was raised. I, d I didn't even think there was any words of a raising money in Hong Kong that happened. But you did get them together. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Exhibit 13 is an itinerary for the DNC while in Hong Kong. Did the Lippo group host a lunch and dinner for the DNC in Hong Kong? For luncheon and dinner for Chairman Brown in Hong Kong, yes. Do you know why the lunch and dinner by the Lippo group have money signs next to them? There's money signs next to them. What does that mean? I have no idea. That was not, that was not my memo at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, if you want to ask for my main chairman, that's what I said. But, but, but it did have dollar signs by it, didn't it? It did. It did. I wonder why those were there. <laughs> okay. Were these lunches and dinners fundraisers? No. Even though there were dollar signs beside the notation? No, sir. Okay. How much money did you raise, if any, in Hong Kong? Zero. Zero. Did the Riottis give any money in Hong Kong? No. You're sure about that? I'm fairly sure about that. You're, you're fairly sure? I'm fairly sure of that. Oh, you're very sure? I'm very sure of that, okay. yeah. Did any LIPO employees or LIPO companies give any money? No, sir. So there was no money that you know of that was given then? No. Did Maria Shaw raise any money while in Taiwan on that trip? I do not know for sure. At least she was trying to, but I don't know whether she did it or not. She was trying to. Right. How did you know that? She was getting a lot of business, businessmen together. You know, I was with her on the trips. I don't know if she did anything or not. But you knew she was trying to raise money and she told you that? I believe she was asked, you know, by, by Melinda to do so. Were any funds, now you weren't in Hawaii, you didn't go to the Hawaii part of that trip? Mr. Chairman, I did not go to Hawaii, no. Do you know if any money was raised in the Hawaii part of that trip? From the news account in the recent years, they're talking about that, that episode, the news accounts indicated it might be, what, $100,000 being raised? That's about, to what extent I but, know about But you don't know? I did not know at that time, no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I think I'll go ahead and yield to you if you're ready. You want to pass? I'll pass. Okay. We'll go ahead. Did you attend a September 27th, 1993 fundraising event with Vice President Gore in Los Angeles? Yes, I did. Did you bring the chairman of China Resources, uh, Shen Warren, and his assistant to the Gore dinner? Yes, I did. 
Uh, who is uh, Shen Warren? He was the chairman of the uh, China Resources at that time in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Is China Resources an equal partner in the Hong Kong Chinese Bank with the Riotti family? I'm not sure exactly percentage ownership when you say the equal bank. Uh, Very equal, close, though. They both are close to 50. I don't know the detail because uh, at that time it could be even less than that. But they both own stock and, and, and own part of the, the bank. The China Resources had the invest had invested in, in uh, Hong Kong Chinese Bank. Yes. Okay. Do you know if the uh, Riotis are still partners with China Resources? It, well, since they have a joint ownerships in the bank, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Were you aware that China Resources has been identified as an intelligence gathering operation with ties to the People's Liberation Army? Mr. Chairman, I was not aware then, but in recent events, I've been going through all these investigations, been told by the authorities. You know they, that now, but you didn't they, know They might then. be, yeah, right. Did you arrange any meetings for Mr. Uh, Shen while he was here in the U.S.? Yes. What kind of meetings were those? I think I brought him and his assistant to visit the White House and tour the White House. Uh, I believe it through Mr. Mark Roma, I arranged a meeting for them to meet was uh, Mr. Jack Quinn. I think he was the chief of staff then was uh, with the vice president. Did you uh, meet with the vice president? Uh, only, in the, only in the fundraising event. No, excuse me, I take it back. During the meeting we had with uh, Mr. Jack Quinn, uh, apparently there was a separate meeting that Mr. Ron Brown and also Mr. Gore was in another bigger room. They came out, they just uh, shake hand. That was the first uh, encounters, that's all. So you, you, you met him in the White House with Jack Quinn and Ron Brown. Did you meet with him later that day? Not in that day. The, the second encounter was will be in the will be in the Los Angeles. Well, I, I guess the records must be incorrect. They said you met with the Vice President Gore twice on September 27th. You don't recall that? Not separate occasion. It's only in in you know Vice President's office. The one room is uh, Jack Quinn. The other one is bigger bigger room. There's only once at that time. Now you had a fundraiser, I guess. Uh, there was a fundraiser that day for the uh, vice president, is that right? No, Mr. Chairman, let me come back a little bit. When the 27th, was the 27th of day in Los Angeles? The 27th of September. Was it Los Angeles or in, in Washington, D.C.? In Los Angeles. In Los Angeles the two times. Didn't meet with him twice, okay. Right, but in uh, Washington, D.C. it's only once. Okay, right. how, how much money did you raise at that event in Los Angeles? Uh, the event was uh, partially participated by my effort uh, in aggregate probably around $100,000, $105,000. Were all of these contributions from LIPO employees or LIPO companies? I believe so, yes. So this was money that uh, came from LIPO employees that was ultimately reimbursed from the LIPO companies in Indonesia? I believe so, yes. You told the Justice Department that you were asked to help in a bigger way for that event, is that correct? As early stage, right. How much more did you raise after being asked to help in a bigger way? I was first being approached by the representative of DNC to raise something like $300,000. Did you uh, make any extra contributions so Mr. Shen and his assistant could attend the event? No. Did Mr. Shen or China Resources pay or reimburse any of these contributions? No. You're sure about that? At least not to me, no. You told the Justice Department that you did not discuss reimbursements for this event with Mr. Riotti. Is that, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, may I trouble you to repeat it? Yes, sir. sure, sure. 
you told the justice department that you did not discuss reimbursements for this event with mr reality is that right i did not discuss with mr reality on the reimbursement for that particular event no well, how did you get the money from the lipo group in indonesia to come into the country to accept the the routine replenishment request which we do almost monthly or you know so this regular. was just a routine thing it would come in right in other words whatever with checks we pay we we'll send it back as a report there will be money coming so in you didn't have to talk to james or mokhtar i did not have to talk to them no yeah just a standard operating procedure that's correct okay uh who's next mr waxman Mr. Jage, would you like me to continue on this? Okay. <clears throat> uh, how do you know that uh, Mr. Shen did not reimburse or pay for any of the contributions? And I said, did not go through me. I... But he could have through another source, but you're not aware of it. Uh, I'm not aware of it, no. Now, let me make sure, I don't want you to make a misstatement here. It did not come through you. Do you know of any other source that money came through? I do not know. I do not know. any source? No. Did you serve as the head of a fundraising committee in Los Angeles in 1993? For that particular event? Yes, for that event. Well, as I said, the, the DNC representative earlier trying to do asked me to host the event to raise $300,000. I could not quite do that. I but, told but, you, but, it, but you were the head of the event there? Or you did not host an event? I, I was not really the main host of the event. There were some other mainstream people who was host. I just joined in. OK, can you look at exhibit number 64? It's a memo from Vida Benavenides to uh, Laura Hardigan at the DNC. Yes. Uh, on page two of that memo, if you'll read it, it says that you originally pledged to raise $200,000 for that event. Is that correct? At least. Maybe that's the amount, maybe, I'm not sure about that amount. As uh, I reported to Mr. Chairman earlier, their representative did come to me, uh, you know, ask me whether I could raise $300,000, and I could not really commit that. Well, it says here on page two that you pledged to raise 200000 Did you say you'd do that? I, I couldn't really be sure whether I did or did not to pledge that. Well, do you recall a second meeting with Darius Anderson on August the 30th, 1993? I don't know whether it's a second meeting, but Darius Anderson was the person that initially contacted me. Did you uh, present Mr. Anderson with a list of demands at that meeting? A list of... Uh, demands, asking him for something. I, I certainly don't recall on that, no. You don't recall? I don't recall. I gave him any demand on that. Exhibit number 65, if you could look at that, is another memo from Avida ben, uh, Benavides, Benavides, Benavides. It says you committed $100,000 if Vice President Gore met with local business and political leaders. Is that true? It said if he would meet with local business and uh, political leaders that you would raise 100000 Is that true?
Mr. Chairman, probably I made a commitment for that, but this is a tie in with the, uh, the, the evening fundraising event together. There's additional requests I want to make on behalf of the community. So you said, you know, I, I think I can raise $100,000 if he'll meet with some business and political leaders. That is correct, from our community, yes. Did, uh, did you get that small, uh, uh, re did you get a small reception with the vice president in addition to that fundraiser? Did you have a small reception in addition to the fundraiser? There was not a reception, just a group meeting in a round table, probably 30 or 35 of a uh, Asian Pacific American community business leader was having an opportunity to meet with the vice president or. Now, was Mr. Shen uh, a part of that meeting? Yes. The memo also says you committed to raising three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars more for the DNC if significant appointments are made. Is that true? I cannot be very specific about the number, but the general direction is I want to get a message across to say we cannot from community point of view cannot really continuously giving money without having anything coming back to the community. Well, that's pretty important. It sounds like there's a quid pro quo where you, you're saying, look, if you'll give some appointments to people, and maybe you had specific people in mind in the Asian American community, we'll raise three to four hundred thousand dollars. Is that about what it was? No, no. My the concept basically is, Asian community has been let down for so many years, just being constantly being tapped on the money, community, political people, they have little concern about it. So one hand of the people in business society is continues giving money, and then political side will complain that the issue was never you, addressed. You weren't getting anything for the hard work and money you were giving in, in, as a community? From a community point of view, as a whole, sir. The schedule says I'm next, so I, I guess I'll go ahead. Were you talking about a possible appointment for yourself there? No, sir. But you were later appointed to the Department of Commerce. That is correct, yes. The memo says since John Wong himself is up for an appointment, his early commitment of $200,000 would be perceived as a buy-off. Did you tell the DNC that? Definitely not. But it does say that in the memo. You have the memo there in front That's of you. right. So they may have thought that uh, that if the money was given, it might look like you were trying to buy a position. If what the memo says that way, they totally mis misunderstood my intention. I see. The memo also says these fundraisers would look foolish if they themselves commit to give without a guarantee of a possible appointment. Now let me go through that again. The memo also says these fundraisers would look foolish if they themselves commit to give money without a guarantee of a possible appointment. Did you say anything like that to the DNC? As I said already, something has to come to the community. I believe I said along the line, but I don't know this is exactly words what it says here. Well, that was their interpretation, evidently. Exhibit number 67, if you could look at that. You have that in front of you, sir? Yes. Uh, it's a letter from uh, March Fong Yu to you, John Wong. This letter is dated four days before the September 27th fundraiser, and it says, quote, White House sources have confirmed that I will be nominated as United States Ambassador to Micronesia, end quote. Was this the type of action that you were expecting from the administration? I was hoping to, at least something in that nature, yes. So that is accurate. Well, that in terms of the getting an appointment for Asian American community people, that well, was it's accurate. it's a letter from uh, March Fong Yu to you saying uh, this letter. He says it says the White House sources have confirmed that I will be nominated. Mr. Yu will be nominated uh, as the ambassador to Mic Micronesia. So that's that's essentially what the kind of thing you were talking about. I miss. I'm sorry. Seems to be a good news to me, yes. Okay. On the top of the letter, it reads, copy to JTR. Is that James Riotti? That's correct. That is correct? Yeah. Was James Riotti in getting his friends appointed to the administration in positions? Was he involved in that in any way?
my best recollection is probably Ambassador Ma Chuang Yu was trying to lobby everybody possible to get things done. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised that uh, Mr. Riyadi was contacted as well. That was September of what year? That's September 1993. Now, James Riyadi met with the then governor of Arkansas on the back of the limousine in California when he pledged to give a million dollars. We don't know what the conversation was, but did you ever hear anything like that he was asking to get more appointments for people in the Asian American community to uh, appointed to positions if he was elected president? But during 1992, sir? Yeah. I did not, no. You don't know whether that was brought up or not? No, I don't. Okay. Was James Riotti in any way involved in the two events with Vice President Gore on September the 27th? He was not. I was. You were involved in those I two. was involved, yes. Let me come back to one other issue real quick. Did, now, as I understood just a minute ago, you said that uh, March Fong, you kind of lobbied Riotti for an appointment. You think he may have lobbied Riotti for... He is trying to get everybody in the community, for instance, writing letter, making calls, for that process. Do you, do you know if James Riotti uh, did write a letter to the president uh, uh, trying to get him appointed? I would not know, sir. I would not know. Do you know if he talked to the president or the vice president or anybody about getting Mr. Yu appointed? The reason I hesitate, if I'm trying to search my memory, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not quite certain whether he did directly to Mr. Clinton or not, but I do know he did not talk to Mr. Gore. He this. did not talk to Mr. Gore, but he right. may have talked to the president. No, I'm saying not possible to talk to Mr. Clinton, but I'm more sure he might have talked to the Mr. Clinton's staff member uh, if he talked to anybody. You're talking about Mr. Riotti now? Mr. Riotti, yeah. Well, Mr. Riotti at that time had been out of the country for three years. He wasn't a permanent resident, didn't even have a green card. But he may have talked to one of the assistants to the president. Do you have any idea who that assistant might have been? The, the, first of all, the Mr. Riotti did not really been out for three years. It's only been out he, he was continuing in and out, in and out for, for you know, the latter part of 92 and beginning of 93. I, I know we're right. splitting hair, hairs right. here. He had a home in California, but he was living, as you said before, almost entirely in, in Indonesia. But anyhow, go ahead. The, the, the reason why I'm hesitating was I believe I learned that Dr. Ma Chifang Yu has asked probably Mr. James Riotti to help out. Mm -hmm. You know, like she was trying to ask a lot of other people, including myself, to do that. And I don't know where I get the information, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I learned from, learned that, the, that the Dr. Mark Chifang Yu indicating she has talked to James Riotti to solicit his help as well. Okay, well, I'll come back to this in a minute there, Mr. Waxman. Well, Mr. Chairman, maybe we can avoid having to come back to it. As I understand the testimony, I want to have it clarified, is you have, you don't know whether uh, March Fong, you talked to Mr. Riotti. You're speculating that she might have because she talked to a lot of other people. Right. And uh, you don't know whether she talked to him, and you don't know whether Mr. Riotti actually talked to Mr. Clinton or Mr. Clinton's staff person uh, about uh, her appointment. Is that uh, accurate? That's the basis of the fair statement on that. I don't know for sure. But as I reported to Mr. Chairman earlier, from Dr. March Fong Yu, she indicated she has contacted uh, Mr. Riotti, you know, whether he might be able to help. But to your knowledge, all you can do is testify about your knowledge. You don't know who, whether 
she talked to Mr. Riotti or Mr. Riotti talked to President Clinton or one of his staff? That, that is correct, basically. I, I know uh, uh, March Fong Yu for many, many years, and I know that she was talking to a lot of people about her interest in, in that appointment, which she eventually got. And uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if she talked to you or other people as well, but I don't know. And so I couldn't tell you that she, she did or didn't. And I gather what you're saying is you can't tell us whether she did or didn't. That's correct. But we both know her well enough to speculate that she probably did because she was pretty thorough. That's right. I, I yield back. Uh, if, if my colleague will bear with me, I just have a couple Mr. more. Chairman, I'm happy to Okay, sure. You thank you. need to, and then I'll do let, what I Let need me to. conclude with this. You talked to her, and she talked to you about an appointment, possible appointment. You think she talked to a lot of other people, and she indicated that she had talked to Riotti as well? I think so, yes. Did anybody, did she or James Riotti or anybody that you know indicate that Mr. Riotti contacted anybody at the White House about her appointment? Anybody? I really can't recall there was any specifics on that, sir. You don't know of anybody that was talked to by Mr. Riotti about her appointment? I don't. Okay. By the way, Mr. Chairman, this is really a lower appointment. I understand. From, I understand. from a community point of view. Actually, Dr. March Fong, you would like to have much higher at our original place. I, we all would like to have higher appointments. Right. Uh, was, uh, let's go back to these, uh, these events. Um, was James Riotti involved in getting uh, any of his friends' uh, appointments to the administration that you know of? Any appointments whatsoever? If there is any connection, it's myself and and other persons from my, uh, from Lippo Group. Mm -hmm. Or uh, anybody. Uh, possibly there is another person with the efforts asked me to submit something to the White House personnel, but nothing ever materialized. If anything being materialized related to Lippo Group, it's myself and also the other persons called Charles DeQuilgio, who was appointed. Charles DeQuilgio. Okay. Was appointed as uh, advisory committee in the. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative, one of the advisory committee. It's, it's not only full-time basis and a regular meeting type. Was that along with Charlie Tree? Was it Charlie Tree appointed to that too? No, that's a separate committee. Separate committee. Definitely separate. Okay. And also different time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, could you look at exhibit number 68? On page, on page two, number 39, it says, James Riotti working with John Wong on an, on an Asian event. If that's not September the 27th, do you know what Asian event that refers to? There was no a Asian events. The, the only Asian event around that time would probably be a September one. Okay. Now, Mr. Wong, I'm going to read to you some statements uh, made in the Senate Governmental Affairs Campaign Fundraising. What's this? Do you know if uh, James Riotti was involved in uh, getting uh, Charlie Tree appointed to the uh, committee he served on? That would be a surprise to me. You wouldn't, you would, you don't know about that? No, okay. Well, Mr. Wong, I'm going to read to you some statements made in the Senate Government Affairs Committee campaign fundraising report. These statements are based on classified secret information that we cannot talk about here. However, the information is a distillation or a cond condensation of a, uh, a variety of sources that the committee was authorized to make public. And the report states, quote, a single piece of unverified information shared with the committee indicates that Wong himself may possibly have had a direct financial relationship with the PRC government. Is that true? Did you have a, f a direct financial relationship with the PRC government? Absolutely not. Okay. Now, Mr. Wong, you worked for the Riotti family for nearly 10 years. 
right? That is correct, sir. Even after you stopped working for them, uh, you've remained in uh, contact with them, correct? That's correct. In fact, over the last several years, while you have not been working, you haven't been working for them, uh, they gave you close to $40,000, 18000 one time and 20000 the other time as a gift. That's correct. So you would uh, consider yourself a close friend of the Riotti family? The friendship remains, yes. Uh, the Senate report stated the following relating to Mr. Riotti. The committee has learned from recently acquired information that James and Mokhtar Riotti have had a long-term relationship with a Chinese intelligence agency. The relationship is based on mutual benefit with the Riottis receiving assistance in finding business opportunities in exchange for large sums of money and other help. Although the relationship appears based on business interests, the committee understands that the Chinese intelligence agency seeks to locate and develop relationships with information collectors, particularly persons with clo close connections to the U.S. government. Is that true? Mr. Chairman, despite the fact I implicated Mr. Riotti during this process, and uh, I personally really have a very highly regards to the Riotti family, in particular Mr. Mokhtar Riotti. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to believe they would do things in that nature, sir. Well, they do have very close ties with many entities within the Chinese government. Yes, but the for different reasons. Well, then you would say the, the findings of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee would be incorrect. I'll read to you again what it says. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, based on my relationship or the working relationship with the Riyadi family and also understanding the vision and philosophy of the Mr. Mokhtar Riyadi, the family has been so ev evangelical and uh, I, I seriously doubt I no. don't have any reason to believe let, what you're saying. Let me end up by the, this, and then I'll yield to my colleagues. Oh, I'm next? Okay, well, then we'll go ahead. Here's a quote that I've used a couple of times already in the hearings by Senator Lieberman from the Democrat Party. He says, quote, non-public evidence presented to the committee demonstrates a continuing business intelligence relationship between the Riyadis and the People's Republic of China Intelligence Service, end quote. That is consistent with what they had in their report, but you still don't believe that's the case. I certainly I don't. Okay. Do you have any explanation of where this information could have come from? For instance, do the Riyadis have business relationships with the government of the People's Republic of China? They do have business relationships with the People's Republic of China, don't they? Mr. Chairman? No, I don't know where the information is coming from, Mr. Chairman. Okay. China Resources Holding... Mr. Chairman, could you yield to me? Sure, I'll yield to you. You know, we did go over all this within the last several days. And he's been asked and he's answered to his knowledge about all of these points. I don't know what its interest it serves to go over them all again. You may not agree with his answers, but those are his answers, and they're on the record, and we've already put them on the record. Well, there's a reason why we're doing this, Mr. Waxman, I assure you. China Resources Holdings, associated with the People's Liberation Army, owns a 50% interest in a Hong Kong Chinese bank with the Riyadi. So there is a connection there financially with the, with the government entities. You work closely... Uh, with both the Riyadis. Do you have any information that would show that the Riyadi family has any relationship with a PRC intelligence gathering agency? No. Uh, in any of the three, 232 phone call contacts that uh, you had with the LIPO entities while you were working at the Department of Commerce, did you ever discuss your work at the Department of Commerce with them? Mr. Chairman, I don't believe I have a 230-some phone calls with the Lipper groups on that, but the, the number indicated what the report was. Uh, to answer your question, I don't believe I have any, anything to do with those things. 
Let me, uh, if it's all right with you, Mr. Shays, uh, I'm going to yield my balance of my time, with, uh, and I'll come back to this later in the day. I have an emergency phone call, so um, I'll yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to say where I come down on this issue, and I realize we all can disagree, but when I read the Cox report, uh, it's kind of guilt by association in one sense. Um, and because whoever does business in China is going to deal with some government entity, and in order to do business in China, you have to uh, participate with some business entity in China, which in most cases is governmental. It could be, it could be th their security people, it could be their military people, because they all seem to own business there. And so I I'm just more comfortable being on the record by saying that it just suggests tremendous need for vigilance. Um, but I probably could take almost any U.S. government business that does something in China and then connect them somehow to the military or intelligence. I'm not going to say that as a result of that, it means that we don't have to be concerned. I just want to say that uh, I've made a determination that, that I can't, on the face of it, feel comfortable saying because there's this relationship, therefore they are um, somehow tied with the military or the intelligence. Thank you, Congressman. Um, but I do want to say it requires a tremendous vigilance because that's the fact is those government, uh, um, every business, almost every business has a government relation and the government then gets involved in intelligence and military and so on. Um, I want to get back to just concluding the issue of your security clearance and I'm going to introduce it by saying to you that um, Ike Skelton, probably one of the most respected, not probably, one of the most respected members of Congress on the Armed Services Committee, did a, asked GAO, GAO to re, do a report, and it was entitled, Inadequate Personnel Security Investigations Pose National Security Risk. And um, in this report to Mr. Skelton, it says, at the, fiscal, at the end of fiscal year 1998, about 2.4 million DOD active duty military, civilian, and contract employees held personal personnel security clearances. 96,000 employees held confidential clearances. 1.8 million held secret clearances. And 524,000 held top secret clearances. From 1982 through September 1999, 80 federal employee and contract personnel, 68 of whom were employed, be, were convicted of committing espionage against the United States. The point is, a whole host of people um, have a security clearance. We've learned that there is approximately 700,000 um, people who have clearance who are uh, past due for review that haven't been looked at, over 700,000. And in this report, we learned that um, DOD personnel security investigations are incomplete and not conducted in a timely manner. As a result, they pose a risk to national security by making DOD, I'm sorry, the time has uh, ended. Mr. Waxman, you have the top floor. Complete your sentence. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waxman passes, and I'll take the time. Uh, no, I'm yielding you. Uh, no, uh, I, I don't want to be yielded. I'm sorry, because you Then can... I'll just pass. Okay, thank you. And I mean no disrespect, Mr. Waxman. It just means that you can reclaim the time if you don't like something I'm saying. So I'd like... I'd like... it all to you, Mr. Uh, no, no, uh, Shea. No, no, it's you're all yours. You're passing, and I'm... Uh, giving it all to you. I, you're passing, and I'm claiming the time. My time. Thank you. Uh, it... <laughs> In the 530 cases we reviewed, DOD granted cl uh, clearance notwithstanding that 92 percent of the 530 investigations were deficient and that they did not contain the information in at least one of the nine investigative areas required by the federal standards for granting clearance, which include confirming the subject's residency, birth, and citizenship, employment records, checking records for prior criminal history, divorce, and financial problems, and interviewing character references. Seventy-seven percent of the investigations were deficient in meeting federal standards in two or more areas, and 16 percent of the investigations identified issues that the Defense Security Service did not pursue per pertaining to individuals' prior criminal 
history, alcohol and drug use, financial difficulties, and other problems that could be caused to deny security clearance. Now, you were given an interim clearance, and we learned from, uh, and this isn't uh, a complaint against you, it's a complaint against the system, but I, uh, I want to understand why you, you know, I want to understand your view of, of your, uh, your responsibilities. Um, Scott Kaminsky, a former investigator, reviewer at OPM, looked at your case. And, and before the committee, he said, Kaminsky told the committee that when he learned Wong still traveled frequently to Asia and had a number of contacts there, included at least one bank, including one, at least one bank account, he made a character level E notation on his reviewer action sheet for Wong. Wang. The E notation signified a potential security problem and was used to alert Commerce OS officials who nevertheless failed to act upon it. After the OPM report was forwarded to Commerce, neither Burns nor Busker uh, returned the file to OPM to request an overseas check. Hence, the overseas check did not happen, and Wong was granted a final top secret clearance on October 25, 1994. So um, based on records, your travel overseas, not, not uh, any p uh, potential national uh, background, but your travel overseas, that notation was not followed through. Now, I'd like to just know some questions in regards to classification. Without going into any classified information, would you tell us what types of information you were briefed on? Congressman uh, I hope you can appreciate a lot of these things probably I cannot really disclose on that. No. But the only general directions yeah. basis will be largely probably involving economics or some of the potential business projects right. okay. you know, on that basis, sir. Uh, wh what regional areas were you briefed on? Basically, I was briefed on uh, Taiwan, Thank the you. big big Asia, big China region, which is including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now, China. It, it has been suggested in some of the documents I've looked at that you had a particular interest in China. Can you explain your particular interest in China? Okay. I haven't finished that. And also, Sorry. maybe Sorry. some of the material related to uh, South Korea. Yes, sir. Uh, and also, maybe Southeast Asia on that. Uh, now I'm going to answer the question particular reasons on China. It may take a few minutes to do that. You it, have the am time. I okay? You have the yes. Time. The knowledge I learned from the the school and over the experiences that the whole world is based on the division of labor concept. In other words, in a free enterprise system whoever has ability to do certain things the best should be able to do that or should be allowed to do that. Should not be a person say like a jack of all trades, you gotta be a, a barber, you gotta be a banker, you gotta be a doctor or be a seamstress. If, you, if any person start doing that, nothing is gonna be too right. So the, the situation is you, you will find out after the Second World War, maybe around 50% of the manufacturer, the goods circulating around the world is made in USA. And nowadays, probably it's around 15%. It doesn't mean you, US is, is a going backwards situation, just a matter of, and the, world's, the pie has become larger. I'm talking about your, not talking about geographical areas larger, but the economy be, size has become bigger, the GMP of various countries become larger, and the, the backward countries become more prosperous and moving forwards on that basis. So over that process, some of the things we, for instance, we did in the 60s, we do a lot of in textile industries, 
and we gradually had to give it up. So Japan stopped picking up. And then gradually you find out steel industry, they're gonna pick it up. And then gradually going downwards, Japan could not hold on those textile industry and steel industry. And then gradually going to Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and gradually going to Southeast Asia, now going to Sri Lanka, go to Vietnam, Burma, all these sort. Do you want to switch life off first before Who has I the time continue? Right now? Mr. Burton, okay. And he passes. And Mr. Waxon? Okay. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So during this transition, it become a challenging situation for the country originally holding on the top position. You are facing a, a country with a top-notch position. We're facing, are we going to get rid of this textile industry? And how are we going to replace that with something better than the other people did not do in order to maintain number one in the world? This is what my, my conce concept behind the scene. Now, however, during the process, you're giving up. How do you handle with the people in those kind of industries, so-called graduating going to sunset industry? You cannot let people say, here's the pink slips, you go, go home. And because you're dealing with a social issue, afterwards, if they go home, they don't find a job, they don't have skill, who is paying for it? The tax part, a taxpayer is still going to pay for it. The government is going to give the unemployment compensation. They're going to fall into the welfare line. All these things are going to happen. So what the concept was, my concept was, Americans should identify certain industry we can do best, and always trying to do best, so the rest of the world always can come to us. If they want that kind of thing, they had to buy from us or secure from us, or they had to pay a good, decent price, or price for a value for their things. But in the meantime, whatever we can produce, invented, out of the ingenuity or ingenuity. That, whatever we can produce what? Whatever we do best. Right. The product that we command the top, but very soon can be duplicated by the other people. Overseas. Overseas or the other economies. All right. For instance, as I said, the steel industry will be number one and gradually shifting over to the developing country. Go to South Korea, go to Korea, South Korea, in Brazil, right now, Russia and China going over there. Now, as you know very well, in light of that sector, Despite the fact we're developing new things, trying to be in number one, for instance, right now we'll go to high tech, we'll go to the filming industry, not necessarily has to be high tech, the film industry, nobody's making the best film as we do here in the United States. So if they want to enjoy the movie, they had to get it from the United States, all right? Now, for those industries being imitated or duplicated from us, that become the biggest threat to us because they're gonna take that business away from us. And how do we handle that, especially on those industries, has a tremendous amount of employment impact to our, impact to our economy. Now, for instance, I, let me mention automobile industry. I think virtually it's about 20% of our economy, I hope I'm right, is tied in somewhat with automobile industry. Assuming this automobile industry being totally shifting over to a foreign nation, how do we handle the employment scheme? situation here in this country. Now, in the one hand, you have a capital investment in, into this kind of industry already, which is set. And then you have a labor industry. You cannot tell the labor, say, in order for all of us to compete with the Japan's making automobile, Koreans making automobile, you guys have to lower your wages. Tell me what you're attempting to ultimately answer my question. Okay. I, I, I'm so what I'm trying to say is, in order to continue maintain this very large sector of the people, continue to enjoy high standard living, the only way is to expand your market shares overseas. Because your unit cost for your investment for that kind of industry, by selling more cars overseas, will gradually going down so people in the United States can continue enjoy the continued high wages, high living standard. So China becomes one of the emerging market, which is the Asian Pacific American region, India is another one, Korea is another one. These are the markets certainly I would be very interested in doing that, see what do we do now. now. Now you were responding to the question though, why, why was your focus more on China? China is one of the potential largest, largest market. I like to 
Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go on. Go I'm on, sorry. Sir. Now, I'd like to see if any projects being given by China to somebody, a joint venture, I'd like to see if there's a chance of giving to the Americans. Mr. Waxman, you have the floor. Uh, I'm going to pass because I want those who are holding this hearing to complete their interrogation because we've been here a long time. But I thought that was an excellent uh, statement of, uh, free, of uh, free trade uh, as, a, as a way to improve the economy, not only of the United States, but other places in the world. And I, I was going to suggest you should go to the Department of Commerce, but you've already worked there. And uh, it looks like you have a pretty solid grasp of what you think are our international interests are in terms of trade and benefiting well, us and and uh, other places in the world as well. So th I thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Waxman. I don't want us to get into a philosophical discussion because this this uh, interrogation ought to be whatever the Republicans want to ask you. I hope not more than five or six times. Get it pinned down. Get your answers. Get the record, and then we should let you go home because you've been here an extraordinary almost 20 hours, and I don't think I've ever in 25 years in the United States Congress sat through a hearing with one person being put into so much detailed questions and answers for this long a period of time. So I commend you for your stamina, and I yield, my, yield back the balance of my time. So Thanks, gentlemen, yields back the balance of the time, and I claim five minutes. The, um, um, you know, integration is uh, a strong word. I think we've been very respectful of you, and uh, we will be here tomorrow if we don't finish tonight, so we hope we finish tonight, but we don't want you to go longer than you want to, and you'll need to let us know when that time comes. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I assume you're acting as a chairman at the right. moment, why, why don't we narrow the questions down and get to new areas instead of repeating old areas rather than threatening this witness that he's going to be here tomorrow. No, it's not because a threat. I don't think it would be fair to ask him to be here tomorrow and have to answer over and over and over again questions that have already been asked. And questions, maybe you you believe it's respectful, and I don't think that uh, it's been disrespectful, but yep. this is, these are certainly questions that are, I would call a fishing expedition, over and over and over again. Does the gentleman yield back his time? Let's start over again, please. Yeah, because he didn't make a point of where it's my time now. Thank you. I'll take the time. The, uh, but, and, and that is the fact, though. I mean, we will be here, and we'll try to be very respectful of your time. Um, I just would love that we've been able to do this, uh, uh, ask all our questions uh, after our committee had asked you questions, and then we could have asked more targeted. But, but that's not the way it is, so we'll just deal with it, and we'll go on with it. Um, the question I have is, you, Ronald Reagan would have been proud of that answer, and I mean that sincerely, uh, but it doesn't explain why you were uh, focused on China when your, your uh, superiors didn't believe China was your area of attention. As I alluded either this morning uh, or yesterday, there's some political turf battles going on in the Commerce Department. And my director sup superior was Mr. Meisner, the Assistant Secretary, who has all the responsibility for the geographic areas for the whole Commerce Department in historical sense. But their territory was taken away He under his guidance and he, you know, he's trying very hard, trying to gain those things back. So he's asking me to, to look into these areas. So that's what I fulfill my duty to do that. The, the sad thing is we have 1.8 million who hold uh, uh, secret clearance and a half a million who hold top secret clearance. It's a lot of people. And to, to justify your basically getting involved over turf battle to make sure it's not a complaint in you, Mr. Wong, but it sure is a complaint of the system. And um, uh, I think you answered the question, uh, what type of information you request? It was basically economic. Uh, once you signed, uh, you know, my understanding is that, that besides having uh, 34 briefings, um, that you, you received cables from 25 to 100 uh, that were delivered pr uh, daily to you. Is that correct? Mm. No, that was an accident. Right. 
Congressman Shea, I think by the, the notes here is I think Wong received 37 briefings. Is this not by my recollection on that? Yeah, 37. You are right. right. Thank you. And also, from the report indicating I had access to 25 to 100 classified cable daily basis. Right. Right. Now, it doesn't mean I would go into the 100 them. You know, I don't know exactly how I did. Did you, did you, um, when you got a, a secret classified documents, did you sign for them? I did. Um, where did you keep these documents? Uh, I think if I had to keep it over, yes, then uh, there's a safe in uh, in the office. Okay. It has a combination. And, I only and, had it. And were you the only one with that combination? I was the only one to have a combination. And then if I turn it back, I'll give it to the secretary. The secretary would, would handle those things. Okay. Did you ever take uh, classified documents out of the Department of Commerce? No, I sir. Mean, I don't mean, uh, and I want to be clear on this. I don't mean because you had some grand design to take them out. I don't mean because you're some spy. I'm not uh, suggesting that. I'm just asking if, as an employee, you ever took these out. I see your counsel saying no, but I want to know what you know. Actually, I was asking him whether he ever took him on a trip. Oh. Did you ever take him on business? No. I definitely don't recall on that. Yeah, now, yeah. the only way, uh, the only thing I want to qualify for that is, yeah. it might be a one of one of a very rare occasion. I had to go to the State Department for the meeting right. uh, with the uh, what's Secretary uh, Secretary Winston Lord. Remember, I alluded to earlier. He has the inter interdepartmental meeting. Whoever has response for Asian America, they might have a chance to, you know, put it in an envelope, special envelope, you know, carry it with me and then bring it back. That's about all. Um, and you didn't take it out. Um, and you were allowed to take it out of the Department of Commerce. That was allowed or not? Or were you, in that instance, doing something you shouldn't have done? I don't recall exactly what the rules. I vaguely remember there might be a situation for the special situation, the envelope perhaps in Mark or something. Uh, you're testing my memory. I really don't remember Your right testimony, now. testimony, though, uh, under oath is that you only took one document out and you took it to the State Department. I might have a chance, one chance in doing that. I, I don't know for sure at this moment even. Um, I'm not even sure that, you know, I did it on, one, on even that one occasion or not. Thank you. I, I have one last area, and I want to make sure that I'm not being redundant to um, the chairman. But let me let me go and ask these questions and say, um, it's it's I'm convinced that the Riyadis are your friends and you're their friends. And James Riyadi, the son of Mokhtar. That is correct, sir. Uh, but you were friends with both. And you maintain that friendship. Um, so I'm going to tell you it is very plausible to me that you will maintain uh, close relationships while you were at um, Department of Commerce. My time has expired. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd love, uh, it's Mr. Waxman, it's your turn now. If I, you would yield to me, I'd love, to, I'd love to ask some more questions just to finish up, but I'm getting towards the end. But without objection, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I'm using your time, Mr. Burton, thank you. Um, I, um, uh, I'd like to know how often you met with the Riyadis uh, during your uh, stint between July 94 and December 95, basically 18 months. These, I would think, would be fairly memorable events because they are close friends and you're kind of your patrons. The more exact number is the number, the number is time they visit the United States. Uh, Mr. Riyadi visit the United States, Washington. Normally, as a courtesy basis, just meet with him. Uh, I was safe to say, it would be safe to say, probably four or five. Four or five only? Approximately yeah. like that, okay. yeah. But it wouldn't be something like 10 or 15? 10 or 15 it in that? Be, it wouldn't be that number. In either. that 18 months time? Yeah. You're, you're more comfortable with a four or five. I don't think time. I want to do that. No, I. Th it's just, you know, it's just. 
it probably will be every time he was in the United States to be safe on okay, saying that. So I don't know how many. Your recollection is it was only four or five times? The number probably will be increased a little bit more because we covered the 18 months time now. Original was the four or five times maybe uh, within a one year or so. Okay. Um, did you accompany James Riotti to any meetings during his stay in Washington? Yes, there is one I can distinctly remember. Okay, was it only one? Probably more. I, I, I can only remember one distinctively right now. Um, what was that meeting regarding? Uh, the one I distinctly remember was the one to visit the White House. Uh, Which you've talked about. This is the... The one where you went to the radio, uh, radio? No, another one, I'm sorry. What was that one then? Tell me what it was. The one distinctly re remember in around September of 1995, uh, visited the White House and had a chance to meet with a Mr. Pr uh, Mr. Clinton. September of 95? Is that yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, why you were employed at the Department of Commerce, did you continue to arrange things for Mr. Riotti when he came to town, whether or not you met with him? Did you, did, were you a facilitator for him in any way? Did you call up people and say, you, you get the gist of my question. Were you, did you uh, uh, continue to be, uh, and I'm not suggesting that's illegal, I'm just wanting right. to know what happened. It might have happened. Uh, The most likely probably see, uh, if it happened, probably the, either the hotel or the limousine situation. Okay. Um, Mr. Yes, Mr. Shea, there might be another case I just uh, thought of it involving a, a radio address situation I, I also went that with. You were, that was the second time when you were in the White House when he was there for the, the president's address? Right, right, the two. But uh, I don't know whether there was other or not. I can't remember. OK. I'd like to just uh, conclude by um, uh, asking, um, on the, the September 9th, 1994, James Riotti mm -hmm. entered the White House at 9.38 AM and did not leave until 2.30 PM. He was scheduled to visit with Mark Middleton. Were you at the White House with Mr. Riotti at all on Friday, September 9th, 1994? It was a four and a half hour meeting. Jay, I certainly don't recall. One of the ways to look at it is my commerce diary, you know, on the diary whether I was there or not, you know. The, the thing that, that um, I feel pretty comfortable having this conviction is that you, uh, you had phenomenal relations at the White House. You were, you were there. Uh, I'm impressed that you were there a lot. Um, you had contacts. It would seem to me that it's very plausible that if Mr. Riotti had an opportunity to be at the White House, one, you would have known about it, and two, you would have probably been helpful. And that's not illegal. I basically agree with that, sir. Yeah. Well, uh, given that, do you, can you tell me uh, why Mr. Riotti would be at the White House for four and a half hours? At this moment, Mr. Chair, I, I really don't have any recollection about this event. Okay, I may try time. to refresh your m memory later okay. on, but uh, I would uh, yield back my time. Thank you. 
Mr. Waxman uh, is not here. Mr. Shays, do you want to go ahead? Let me uh, continue my questioning then. Uh, we're moving along fairly well, finally, so uh, hopefully we'll hopefully we'll be able to conclude today. If not, we'll be awfully close. I don't want to denigrate you, Mr. Wong, but I understand Mr. Waxman, while I was gone, was saying that you're the kind of person that ought to be at the Department of Commerce. And this isn't my opinion, but Jeffrey Garten, who was the under Secretary of Commerce over there after all this came out said he wasn't the kind of person who ought to represent the American government. And the only reason I say that is because because of the problems that you've had, I think it's important that on the record and before this body that both sides and both opinions be expressed very clearly and and, uh, and, and that's why I put that in the record. Earlier I asked you some questions about Maria Shaw. You worked with her on fundraising events, isn't that correct? Yes. I'm going to read you a passage from the Senate Governmental Affairs Report that relates to Mrs. Shaw. The committee has learned that Maria Shaw has been an agent of the Chinese government, that she has acted knowingly in support of the Chinese government, and that she has attempted to conceal her relationship with the Chinese government. We're talking about the Chinese government in Beijing, the PRC. The committee has also learned that Maria Shaw has worked in direct support of a PRC diplomatic post in the U.S., i.e., she was spying, diplomatic post here in the U.S., and she was working for the PRC. Did you know that? I don't even believe that. You don't believe that? Right. I have no reason to believe that. They got this from intelligence sources. Well, Based on the dealing I, my knowing Maria Shah, she might have tried to get this business, but I don't know what is going to go to the intelligence side and acting as spy well, or not. Let no. me read this one more time. The committee has learned that Maria Shah has been an agent of the Chinese government, that she acted knowingly in support of the Chinese government, that she attempted to conceal her relationship with the Chinese government, and the committee has also learned that Shah has worked in direct support of a PRC diplomatic post in the U.S. You didn't know any of this? I don't. You don't believe it? I don't. Are you aware of any contacts that Maria Shah had with officials from the government of the People's Republic of China? Are you aware of any contacts she had with them? I don't know openly, but I can imagine the, the most things that she made a contact just for her immigration business, occasionally we had to go to the Chinese consulate. That's to the extent I know. Well, based on classified information, this is secret information. Some of it I cannot sure. give out, but I'll read you sure. what the committee said. The committee has received information that Xiao worked with Ted Xiong and John Wong to solicit contributions from Chinese nationals in the United States and abroad for democratic causes. Xiao and Wong, in particular, worked together to identify non-U.S. citizens overseas who might contribute money to democratic causes. Is that correct? I don't believe it would be a non-U.S. citizen, but if there's a non-U.S. citizen, if there's any money being raised, probably at least the party has a green card. Uh, to the extent I know, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, the, the committee over there came to that conclusion that, uh, that uh, you and uh, Maria Shaw worked together to identify non-U.S. citizens overseas who might contribute money to the Democrat causes. And you say that's, uh, you don't... No, you say non-U.S. citizen, but non -US. not dispute on that part, but if they have a green card, but you're still non-U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. that is to the extent she might have a... No, I understand she probably have... Like the Riyadis. Not right now, but the like Riyadis... No, no but, but like the Riyadis back then. Yeah, okay. before, yeah. All righty. Let's go on to another subject here. Did you discuss the February 19th event with Mark Middleton before it took place? This is February 19th, 1996. It was a breakfast event with the vice president. Probably I did, yes. You did. Yes. Did Mark Middleton attend the dinner on February 19th, 1996? I didn't think he attended it. He probably is standing in the back, probably, the most. I, I can remember now. You stayed in the back, you mean? In a, in a dining room. But he didn't go to the dinner itself, he no, just watched. No, he stayed in the back, just yeah. watched, yes. Mm -hmm. Wonder why he didn't attend the dinner, do you know? 
The basic was the Asian Pacific American as a, as a focus at that time. He just didn't want to be, didn't think he should be involved? I don't know what was the reason, but basically that was the Asian Pacific American dinner. Well, Middleton did attend the breakfast on February the 20th, as shown in Exhibit 324, and if we can put that up. It's a photograph of him with Vice President Gore. Can you uh, tell why he attended? Do we have that picture? In any event, mm -hmm. um, he, he has the picture, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I have a yeah, the picture. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Do you know why? Why did he attend that event? Event. I believe one of the participants uh, during those uh, the dinner and breakfast was a lady called Nina Wong. Nina Wong. No, Nina. Nina. Nina Wong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Congressman Latore yesterday was referring to the head table. Mm -hmm. That was a late, one of the persons sitting on the table, Nina Wong. And that was uh, Mr. Middleton's apparently friend. Mm -hmm. And maybe he was just being concerned, trying to be more courteous to say Nina Wong was there. He just wanted to tag along. I didn't remember he was sitting on the table, though. Well, did, uh, do you know if he contributed to that uh, event? I'll, I'll yield myself five more minutes here. To, to the best of my knowledge, no, he did not. No, he did not. And he did bring a guest. That's correct. And her name is Nina? Uh, Nina Wong. Uh, Nina Wong, OK. Yes. Did you discuss any of the contributions that were made for that event with Mr. Middleton? Did you talk about any of the contributions uh, that were given at that event? Did you talk to Mr. Middleton about them? Uh, I don't specifically remember. I talked to him about the money, but he can he can he can view the the situation over there. Roughly, how many people come in? I'm pretty sure he was aware of how much per ticket. You know. But you didn't go into any details. No on detail on that. No. Okay. On February 19th, 1996. There was an event, and Ernie Green gave $6,000 to this event in a check dated uh, March 8, 96. This event took place on February 19, 96, but the check was dated, uh, post-dated to March 8. A tree is listed as the solicitor on that check. Uh, several days before the $6,000 contribution was made, Green deposited uh, $2,500 and $3,500 cash into a Riggs bank account. OK, do you know Ernie Green? I met him before, yes. How, how do you know him? Uh, I believe it's through, through some a, a function that's through Charlie Tree. Mr. Green was president, uh, present at the February 19, 1996 event. Can you tell me why he was there and who invited him? He just came by himself. He came along, and uh, as a friend of uh, uh, Mr. Tree. Nobody invited him? He knew of the event. I did not really, you know, there's, basically, there's, I did not invite him on that. Who, do you know who did invite him? Was it Charlie Tree or Mark Middleton or who? The best I can, I can guess probably through Charlie Tree. Charlie Tree? Yeah. Exhibit 328, if you could take a look at that, sir. It's titled COMM 0326. See that? I got it. You got it. Yes. It's a page from uh, your diary from shortly before the February 19th event. You have a reference to Chu Lai, Mark Middleton, and Ernie Green, and Hong China Limited. What do those notes refer to? Uh, the Hong Kong China Limited related to Nina Wong. Nina Wong, uh, right after the Hong Kong China Limited, there is few Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. That's a Nina Wong's a Chinese name. Were you ever in contact with Green about that event? I certainly don't recall to contact him about it. I'm, I'm pretty sure he knew about that event because the first Asian Asian Pacific American fundraising event ever. 
On the bottom left of that page, there's a reference to another company. Can you read your note? And does it refer to a China Hughes or what is it? What does it say? No. Is it? Remember, you read the uh, Mr. Chairman read the Hong Kong China. Mm -hmm. There's confusion. Could be China Hong Kong. Exactly name for the Miss Nina Wang's company. Mm -hmm. it, in other words, it could be a mistake. It could be Hong Kong China or China Hong Kong. Wasn't sure at that time. I see. On March the 8th, which was several weeks after the event, Mr. Green wrote a check for 6000 to the DNC. It was credited to the February 19th event. Why did Mr. Green contribute that $6,000? If I remember correctly, at the, event, at the end of the event, he told me he was going to give some money since he was attending. Well, the event was cost $12,500, didn't that it? That is correct. Why did he only give $6,000? Well, it... It was not unusual. Some of the people did not give it money at a particular time or give less money. And that was the intention. There's a different consideration. Some of the people might have been giving money way ahead of time. Historically, it's been known. So I would not really, in that urgency, say, you come to this event, give me the money. And I was quite leaning because of that, that relationship basis. If I knew some people were going to give more money, I was what was very so, much willing to wait. So you let some people in for less money because you're trying to raise as much yeah, as possible. That's correct, sir. Yeah, that's what I thought. Who gave you that check? Did Charlie Tree give it to you? I thought... It... Excuse me just one minute. Sure. I don't record exactly, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, thank right you. now. If you'd continue. Uh, I, I have a vague uh, memory that might be sent in by mail. Sent in by mail. And would you tell me why this check came in so long after the event? It was because it was sent in by mail, or? No, no, no. It's just been, he was delaying writing checks, I believe. Did you discuss this contribution with anyone, whether it was Charlie Tree or Ernie Green? It's a question. I don't, um, well, you just testified. You, you had a conversation with him. Yeah, he was going to go through there. He was, he was reimbursed for this contribution. He's going to go through Charlie Tree. He's going to be reimbursed for Florence. So he's going to find out what he knows about the next person who's going to be reimbursed. She wasn't able to look at the questions for that. She attended this event Saturday. Did you know what that is? Thank you. Is, um, is Mr. If Mr. Waxman went to the floor because my time is up. Should. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Um, the, the, yes, Congressman, sir. let me proceed to answer your question. Yes. As I just reported to Chairman Burton, uh, Mr. Green was in an event. At the end of the event, he, was, he said, oh, I'll give you some money. I'll send you some money. Mr. Green's bank records indicate that on February 21st and 23rd, Mr. Green deposited 2500 and 3500 respectively, in cash into his bank account. Do you have any knowledge of these cash deposits by Mr. Green? No, I don't. Do you have any knowledge whether Mr. Green was reimbursed for this contribution by Charlie Tree? I do not know. Uh, why was the 6000 Green contribution credited to this event? Because he attended that event, and I got that check later on. Now, um, Nina Wang uh, made contributions to this event as well. Do you know Nina, Nina Wang? I didn't think she made a contribution to this event, sir. Excuse me, I, I misspoke. She did not make any contribution for the event due to her immigrated, immigration status. Um, 
But let me uh, further ask, uh, she, she is not uh, a U.S. citizen? Is that, that is correct. correct. Okay. Uh, and nor does she hold a green card? She does no. not hold a green no. card? No, no. Okay. To the best of my knowledge, sir. In one interview, um, I think with the FBI, you indicated that you knew that uh, Nina Wang's company had been the target of a takeover attempt by the Lipo Group. Which company was this? Did you ever have any dealings with Nina Wang regarding this takeover? I think it's related to the Hong Kong China, or China Hong Kong, which I was uh, flip up. Maybe Hong, uh, Hong Kong China okay. Limited. Did you ever have any dealings with this? I'm sorry? Did you ever have any dealings with Nina Wang regarding this takeover? No, I did not. Did you ever discuss Nina Wang with the Riyadis or other Lippo Group personnel? I personally dis did not discuss on that, but I, I would not doubt throughout the channel the, uh, oh, I, sh I take it back. The Lipo Group people might have known that Nina Wang, you know, attended that event. Okay. Uh, and and who, who therefore invited her to the event? I believe she came in because of Mark Middleton. Okay. Um, evidently, we have an exhibit that indicates that Nina Wang was seated at the head table. Do you know why she would have been? Did Charlie Tree or Mark Middleton request that she be seated at the head table? I believe it's Mark Middleton requested that. Uh, and again, she did not give any money for this event. That is that. That correct? is correct. Okay. Did anyone affiliated with Miss Wang give any money to this event? Uh, not that I know of, sir. Why would Miss Wang be seated at the head table if she did not give any money for the event? What what made her so important? Uh, number one, she is probably the, the wealthiest person in the world, the woman in the world, that I learned, and also. The reason I know the reputation is because my knowledge from previous employment with the Lippo involving the takeover battle, she did not relinquish. She was a very tough lady. Um, she was giving money to a lot of charitable organization, a lot of uh, school as well, I understood. Uh, one of the cons considerations, I believe, uh, she has uh, done something for Shoot some one second, Ms. Shea. I was learned, uh, sorry, I was learned the, uh, through Ms. Mr. Middleton, she even, she probably did already giving some money to the Clinton's birthplace, some foundation, or libraries of that sort. In other words, the overall, uh, yeah. from, from her, it was quite, quite big. It's our indication that you uh, indicated to the FBI that you found out after the event that Wang had given 50000 to the Clinton Birthplace Foundation. First off, what is the Clinton Birthplace Foundation? The best I, I know is uh, they might be doing something for Clinton's birthplace. They're trying to build up something over there. So there's lots of ways for people to contribute, even if they can't contribute to campaigns, it appears. How did you find out that she had contributed this 50000 I believe through Mr. Middleton. Um, did you have any idea at the time of that that Wang was giving funds to the Birthplace Foundation or any other group? That I did not know, sir. Did you ask Tree to take Wang to her hotel after the event, and did you ask Tree to do anything else special for Wang? Uh, I didn't hear the first part of it. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. going too quickly. I'm sorry, yeah. No, you do not need to apologize. You've had a long day. Did you ask Tree to take Wang to her, ho her hotel after the event? I did not do that, no. Okay. Did you ask uh, Tree to do anything else for her, if not that? No, not for me, no. Now, Ms. Wang also attended an event in May 13, 1996. We had just been talking about an event in February 1996. Um, you, evidently, you had some notes about this May 13th event in your diary. You, you keep, kept a diary on just a calendar? Yes, I yeah. did. Just, uh, do I start my new time? Yeah, okay. 
Um, this is Exhibit 417, and uh, is a listing of the head table for the May 13th event. It indicates uh, Nina Wang sat at the head table. Is that accurate as far as you're concerned? Yes. This is Exhibit 417. Yes, I did. Um, wait, wait, yes, you did what, would you say? Yeah, I did know. She, she was a range yeah. that had to And the question is, um, did, um, do you know if Wang contributed any money to this event? No. Okay. Uh, again, if not, is, why was she at the head table? I mean, she's... Now, this time is different now. This time was... Uh, Really recommend, recommended by Mark Jimenez. I, Mark, I, Mark, who, Mark Jimenez. Okay. Uh, J I M E N E S or something like that. Easy, easy. I'm sorry, Jimenez. The first e exhibit um, 432 is a page from your diary. I, we call it a diary, but is that your calendar? It's a sort of notebook because I did not have any secretary. Okay. So a I was trying to. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Uh, from your notebook uh, from the period around May 13th, the United States, Nina Wang, quote, public and, quote, 100 Nina, end of quote. Did you solicit Nina Wang to contribute for this event? No, I did not. Do you know if anyone else has to give to this event? Not to my knowledge, no. And are you aware of any contributions that Wang may have made to any other entities in order to attend this event? That I don't know either. Okay. Now, um, let me uh, get back to um, uh, James Riotti. I, I, I'm, I think I've been very candid with you, and I think you've been candid with me, but I, I'm, I'm left a little uncomfortable with your response about the number of times you might have remembered the Riottis. It's, it's, these are two important uh, players in your back. Now, I do realize this. If you ask me what I did umpteen years ago and over what span, so I, I want to take it slow enough, but during the time you were in commerce, that's what I'm interested in. And it, it may be that by the time we're finished with these questions, you will have had a number of events, but with them, and we'll just say they happened. Or I might draw some other conclusions, but I at least want to know what the facts are. Uh, my sense is that you you really were at the White House with Mr. Riotti, James Riotti, more than than once or twice during this period. And um, this is a longer video than I'm particularly happy about, but uh, would you put that video in? This is, uh, the event is September 10th. White House radio address, and I, if you don't mind, I'm going to want you to identify the people. There are just a few people um, that that I think, uh, and we can fast forward it after. Um, these are people that you don't really know right now. These okay. are not, these uh -huh. are not your guests, correct? No. Okay. You know, they're not, they're not a lot of American people who get to to participate. There. This is a big deal. Now, are these your guests? That's a. Uh James, James and Eileen Riotti. And yeah. that's his uh, wife? Right. Yes, thank you. Yes. Now, uh, they're going to talk for a while, so if you don't mind, we can just speed it so you still see the... Can you do that? If not... No, I don't want you to do it that way. Uh, I'll... I'm sorry. Is it... Yeah. So it, it, they, they have a conversation. Now, and this is, this is who? That's the Mr. Riotti's guest. And who is Mr. Riotti's guest? I can't spell his name. I, I believe he was the Minister of Education of Indonesia. In Indonesia, and this looks like his daughter. The family, probably. Yeah, and his wife. Okay. And that's James Riyadi. I, I remember the, the name is called Wadiman something. There was a part of me that didn't want to show this because, you know, it's a very touching uh, interaction of family with the president, and that happens all the time. But I, I thought, you know, there are not many of my constituents who have this privilege. I know. 
<laughs> now this is the gift. What is the gift? It's a knife of some kind of a ceremonial. Something like this ceremonial stuff is a okay. gift. Is that you with your back to us? Right yes. There? Okay. You had a suit on. They didn't. I'll... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't be, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is the sound uh, purposely off? Okay, okay, right, so while I was talking, thank you. You can put it back on. The second, we're gonna have the next people come up. I have constituents, if they get to look at the White House, it's exciting, if they get to go in for a visit, it's a thrill, but they don't get to meet the president and not get to go to the Oval Office. So this is quite a special opportunity. <laughs> now we're going to have some people come up, and I'd like you to tell me who the others are. I hope you've had a good stay here in this little camp. I can't wait to go to Indonesia. Yes, yeah. there, sir. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. But then, the ambassador. This ambassador. Turn the sound down. I'm sorry. This ambassador Arafin of Indonesia to the United States and his wife. Okay. At that time. So Mr. Riyadi has come with a, 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 a minister. Ambassador at that time, I'm sorry. An, an ambassador, and he also came, the er, gentleman before you believe was a government official. Who's this? Again, that is right now. This is uh, my successor, Lippo's successor, Johanna. Okay. So he works for the Riyadis. That the is Lippo correct. Group. Okay. And that's Mark Middleton? Yes. Okay. Then that's me. I, I have a coat on. I didn't have a title on this. Okay. He put his arm around you and not Mr. Uh, Rialdi, Riotti. You're good friends. And, that, and you should be proud of that. You have a, a long-term relationship with the president. Now, is there anyone else? That, that, uh, I, to the extent the power that was it, uh, uh, Mr. Shea. Yes, right. that, that's power of okay. all the people, yeah. I can okay. Now, the reason I'm showing this is, thank you, sorry, turn the sound off, thank you. The reason I'm showing this to you is this really should bring back the recollection of the meeting the day before, because the day before Mr. Riotti was in the White House at 9, uh, 9.38 in the morning and didn't leave until 2.30. And whether or not, and I want to be very clear with you, Mr. Wong, I want to be very clear with you on this point. Whether or not there is a White House document that says you were there, it is important for you to recall whether or not you were there. And it is not going to be difficult for you to remember, because this is a very memorable event. Mr. Shea, yes. thank you for bringing this table in. Mean, you know, I'm also getting the age and then going around so many things and untimely is something I remember more, much better than the other. I, I but this will say, help I, me on this. I'm just going to concur. I'm going to say right. it for the record. I, I pass no judgment on your not. But now having seen this, can you f provide us any information? I'll tell you, I did not attend the so-called that few hours that event you were talking about the prize day in well, the White you House. Were, you weren't in the White House today. I before. was not in the White House. Now, no. do you know what they talked about? Because that I don't know. Okay. You didn't talk to Mr. Riotti at all about this event? I should not say I did not talk to Mr. Riotti on that because you saw my pictures were there and I was with them. Oh, no, I mean about the event the day before. It just, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, as close as you are to the president and to Mr. Riotti, that you would not have had some conversation about that event. No, I had a conversation. I, I was not there during the day in the White House. I'm clear on that. 
Right. You were not there at the event. I want to know if you talked to Mr. Riotti at all about the event. Please go ahead. Oh, that's right. Congressman, the best I can recollect, and this is a tie in with the yes, this few days you were talking about. Uh, remember the, the hundred thousand dollars to Mr. Hubble? Remember what? How could they forget? Yes. <laughs> we're talking about that. This is probably some people say that's a help situation, or helping him totally. It's not really a job job arrangement. I believe these things is done through Mr. Hubble, it's not through me. You think the uh, visit to the White House was done? This is the, the arrangement through, through, through Mr. Hubble. And then if there is any meeting, because I indicated to you earlier, I did not, I was not in the White House, you know, I don't know whether the, the White House visit was also arranged by Mr. Hubble or not, which uh, I wouldn't be able to speculate. Okay, but the bottom line is you didn't arrange the Friday meeting, but somebody did. That's correct. And uh, we know that he uh, went in to see Mark Middleton. Do you know, did he talk to you at all to tell you if he met with Bruce Lindsay? Or do you know if, in fact, if he met with Bruce Lindsay? I really cannot rule out any, any of the what your possibilities because I don't know. Your testimony is you can't rule it out, but you don't know. That's correct, okay. yeah. Um, that was a memorable event that Sunday, which you, you mentioned. There was the event before, which you now recall and know that you did not arrange, according to your testimony, nor did you have much of a dialogue with Mr. Riotti about it. You speculate that it might have been involved with the uh, Hubble, uh, that Mr. Hubble may, in fact, have, have provided this opportunity. Um, and it was during the time of the $100,000 payment by Mr. Riotti to Mr. Hubble. That's a speculation on your part that he arranged that, but you didn't. I didn't. That's correct, sir. Okay. It had to be arranged. Yes. I shouldn't use the word speculating. I'm pretty sure I know that Mr. Hubble made an arrangement on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. How, how did you know that? Probably Mr. Riotti mentioned about that to me. Okay. Right. Uh, I yield back the time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back the time. Excuse me? I yield back. The gentleman yields back to balance his time. I think what we'll do now is uh, go to the council. Each council member has 30 minutes. I'm not sure they're going to use all of that. They have some questions that uh, uh, they feel need to be asked that, uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Shays and I haven't asked for Mr. Waxman, so we'll now yield uh, 30 minutes. Could to I just you. ask a question before, Mr. Chairman? I have no other. Uh, yes, and I want to say no, that. No, no, I, I have no other questions. I just, I just want to ask in terms of the process. Um, that both sides will ask questions, and then will we be given a, just a short uh, opportunity to make a comment? Yes. In fact, uh, w if Mr. Waxman's here or you or I, have, we'll have closing comments, and then we'll be through. I, I don't I, think I, I have, have any... no other questions to ask. That's correct. Yeah. So yield to the Minority Council. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Chairman, this is just a point of clarification. Um, uh, earlier when we talked about Maria Shaw, Mr. Wong was asked a question about that. The chairman read to you the majority report. There was also a minority report on Maria Shaw. And just to make it part of the record, we ask unanimous Without objection, so ordered. The, um, you, you, if you we'll want just to read a short excerpt. That's from fine. It. That's fine. The, the minority Senate report on Maria Shaw said that the committee received non-public information connecting some activities she undertook while an immigration consultant in the state of California and the early to mid-1990s to ch Chinese government officials. This information did not involve her activities with respect to fundraising, and there was no information presented to the committee during its investigation that connected Shah's fundraising activities to the Chinese government. In an affidavit submitted to the committee, Shah strongly objects to this allegation, 
outlines her ties to Taiwan and the U.S. and describes her activities while an immigration consultant in California. In light of the incomplete investigation of the committee on this issue, the minority believes that the committee lacks sufficient information about Shaw to endorse or rebut these serious allegations. The fact that the majority emphasizes these allegations throughout its report without putting the allegations in context or addressing this information is troubling. I only put that on the record, Mr. Chairman, because uh, the witness before had a different view of Maria Shaw. I don't know if he has any response in light of this information. No, I, my, my response to, to Mr. Chairman stands. Uh, at least still, I didn't have any reason to believe she was uh, conducting that kind of activities as indicated by the report, I'm sorry. About. Thank you. We yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back his time. Uh, the majority council now has 30 minutes. Mr. Wong. How are you, sir? Good afternoon. Thank you. It's been Thank a very you. long day for you. Thank I realize you. that. I'll try and be as quick as I can. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons we have hearings like this is because we want to learn things. And one of the things we were very interested in was the relationship between uh, Mr. Charlie Tree and uh, James Riotti. And um, I think before the hearing began, we had an impression that there wasn't much or any of a relationship between Mr. Tree and Mr. Riotti. And I wanted to follow up and ask you a few questions. Sure. about Mr. Tree and Mr. Riotti. Um, Mr. La Tourette asked you questions, uh, I believe it was the day before yesterday, and he asked uh, at any time during your acquaintance with Charlie Tree, did you ever discuss with him any travel that he might have made to Jakarta? And, and you answered that he had some business contact in Jakarta. And uh, then Mr. La Tourette asked, and was that the subject of conversations that you and he might have had? And you said, oh, he was talking about business contacts, businessmen he knew in Indonesia. And then later on, we, we learned that Mr. Turi actually went over and had a meeting with uh, Mr. Riyadi in Jakarta. And, and if you could, please tell us as much as you can about that meeting. I did not know the detail of the meeting. Basically, the best I learned is he visited Mr. Riyadi. Uh, Mr. Riyadi had made a comment to me and said, despite the fact they both were Little Rock earlier, as you know, Mr. Tree's background, he owned the restaurants in Little Rock, and Mr. Riyadi also uh, runs a daily banking business in Worthen Bank in Little Rock. They hardly had a chance to, to meet, but although they knew sort of there's each other, they knew the existence of the, the persons, uh, he made a comment to me as well, Charlie Tree is, is not a bad guy. You know, and uh, by indicating, certainly in his words, is he did not have a lot of resources, uh, relative speaking, compared to the uh, the uh, the Riyadis. Did you have any part in arranging the meeting between Mr. Tree and Mr. Riyadi? No, sir, I did not. Now, just following up on that one exchange you had with Mr. LaTourette, um, Mr. LaTourette said, uh, specifically, are you aware of any relationship between the Tree family and the Riyadi family? And, and your answer to Mr. La Tourette was, no, he had, to the best of my knowledge, he had no relationship with the Riyadi family. And I wanted to follow up and ask you whether you thought that was an accurate characterization. That depends on the period of time. You're talking about business relationship, the most closest one we're going to talk about is that meeting, and also probably something uh, Mr. Tree might be able to work something in China because he, Mr. Tree has some extensive uh, at least appear to have an extensive relationship uh, or contacts in China. And uh, at that time, probably Lip was also developed something in China. And in light of overall situation, as I just made a comment that Riyadi and, uh, and the tree uh, meeting, maybe tree might be helpful in helping uh, with his service to the Riyadi family on Lipo in, in some of the projects in China. Now, in terms of that relationship, that's at that point onward, if talking about that relationship, that's the that's first time I knew there was a relationship. Prior to that, I really did not have any knowledge that they had any relationship. And but what, what I'm trying to get at here is you were asked if um, there was any relationship, and you said no, to the best of my knowledge. He had no rela relationship with the Riyadi family. After that, um, we showed you a, a copy of a, a receipt, OK? 
from uh, a limousine ride, and it became clear that, uh, at least you told us, that you uh, had a limousine go to Dulles Airport and pick up Mr. Riotti, and then there was a little bit of um, skirmishing over details, and then it became clear that later that night after a fundraiser, Mr. Riotti uh, actually stayed, and, and as, as did you, mm -hmm. with Mr. Tree in an apartment at, the, at uh, Mr. Tree's place. And uh, just the concern was when Mr. Lotteret asked you whether there was any relationship at all, your, your answer was no. I, I wanted I, to follow I, up I uh, like to clarify that. Uh, my interpretation is, is family relationship. I says no. No, I took it as that way. And if, if you could briefly explain that, because the I don't family really understand relationship, the family the, relationship. The family relationship, like a blood tie or a brother-in-law or that kind of situation, sir. Okay, well, following up on, on the time that um, you and Mr. Riotti stayed with uh, Mr. Tree in, in the apartment, who arranged that? I did not arrange that. I've learned from uh, Mr. Riotti at that time. Mr. Riotti indicating that Mr. Tree invited him to stay there. He said he decided to stay there instead of staying in a hotel. He told me that. I did not arrange that the uh, arrangement, accommodation re arrangement on that, no. So it, it's fair to say then that Mr. Tree arranged this independently with Mr. Riotti? That's my, my belief, yes. And, and do you know how he did that? Was it a, a meeting or a telephone call? That I would not know, uh, sir, Mr. Wilson. Did, did you know that um, before you picked up uh, Mr. Riotti in the limousine, did you know that Mr. Riotti and yourself would be staying with Mr. Tree at the uh, at, at Mr. Tree's apartment? The best of my recollection is Mr. Riotti mentioned to me he also made the hotel reservation, but he also invite, was invited by Mr. Tree, and he was indicating he would decided to stay with Mr. Tree. Okay. Now, following up, we we had a very brief discussion about after the campaign finance matters became very public and, and you were receiving a great deal of media attention, uh, you ended up staying at Mr. Tree's apartment for a period of time. And you indicated it was, it was one to two weeks that you stayed at Mr. Tree's apartment. Um, can, can you recall with any more specificity how long you actually stayed at Mr. Tree's apartment? I cannot give you the exact time. I think during my I, I, Mr. Wilson, I distinctly remember during the, uh, you know, judicial watch, uh, the deposition period time, and I, I reported, Mr. Chairman, I was uh, moving around from places to places, and final night I went into Mr. Tree's uh, apartment uh, in, in Watergate, and during that deposition period time, I was staying uh, with Mr. Tree's apartment. And how did you arrange that? Did he call you and make the offer, or did you call him and ask him if you could stay at his apartment? I believe I initiated that. I, I was wondering if I could stay there because uh, the Watergate apartment was relatively secure. You know, media cannot really just knock on your door and go in to film you. Um, he also recommend, you know, that's not and also, well, maybe it's just a mutual situation, but I believe I initiated that whether I could stay in there, sir. Had you ever stayed there before, apart from the time with Mr. Riotti? Yeah, uh, I'm not certain right now. I definitely, I visited that apartment before, whether I stay overnight or not, if uh, I could not recall. In the event, I really cannot recall I ever stayed there. I, I did visit that, that apartment a few times before, yes. 
Now, I'd like to move along just a little bit to another subject. Uh, you had mentioned that, that you heard that Mr. Tree might be help with, helpful with ventures in China. And I wanted to know um, whether you ever communicated that to Mr. Riadi. No, that, I learned that is basically information from Mr. Riadi, what he might, uh, after the meeting between Mr. Riadi and Trees in Jakarta, he briefly mentioned he might have uh, Mr. Tree to do, say, in China, something in that nature, but in, uh, was not really in the specific form as I was uh, shown on that translated report yesterday. When, when did um, Mr. Riadi tell you that Mr. Tree might be helpful in Chinese ventures? I believe it's around that period of time in the September, you know, around September, maybe in that period of time, yeah. Before that, had Mr. Riadi ever asked you any questions about Charlie Tree? I certainly did not recall that. As I made a comment to you earlier, uh, just now, Mr. Riyadi had made a comment after their joint meeting in Indonesia. He said he's, basically he's not really a bad guy, you know, on that. Did, um, have you ever had any, uh, have you, you had any in the last couple of years, any discussions with Mr. Riyadi about Antonio Pan? Not with Mr. Riyadi on Antonio Pan at all. Do you know where Mr. Pan is right now? To answer your questions, is uh, no, I don't know, but I can tell you what I knew before, what is the background. <clears throat> he came just, from... Just for the last couple of years, I'm not right. interested. Before. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, he came from Taiwan, might be a set foot in Hong Kong sometimes, uh, could be in China, but I understand he, he migrated his family to New Zealand. So he might have a status in New Zealand. That is to the extent I know. Certainly sometimes he was traveling to the United States during that period of time, sir. Have you had any conversations with Mr. Pan in the last two years? No, sir. Apart, apart from Mr. Tree, and you discussed how Mr. Tree visited uh, Mr. Riyadi in uh, Jakarta, uh, do you know uh, did you participate in, in setting up any visits for other government officials or former government officials with Mr. Riyadi in Jakarta? Uh, you talking about government official of the United States? Yes. During my DNC time or Commerce time or when? Uh, prior uh, to well, that? We can take both dur during the time that you were at the Department of Commerce. Certainly, I don't believe so. In the Commerce Department, I'm trying to stay away with anything from the LIPO, so I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, DNC, I made an arrangement, not for the official, for the daughter of the Chairman Fowler. She was traveling over to, uh, the first time as a student, I think from Hawaii, being a father was a little bit concerned coming to the foreign land, and he came to me and said, I understand you have some friends in Indonesia, whether you, somebody can take care of my daughter. I, want, I said I'd be glad to do that, which I did. Again, she's not official, but has a tie with some official uh, title, at least the chairman of the DNC. Um, but you didn't, as far I, as you recall, you didn't set up any other meetings with... I, I don't, officials. I'm trying to use, search my memory whether I did or did not. I want to be very careful, you know, on that front. Uh, no, that's understood. <laughs> Just moving to something else, we've, we've had a little bit of difficulty uh, coming to a conclusion as to when Mr. Riyadi left the United States, and, and there have been a few exchanges about this subject, and you've told us that um, Mr. Riyadi traveled, he had a house in California, he obviously has at least one premises overseas, one house overseas, uh, and it's a little difficult to, to come to a full understanding of that. You, you were living in California in uh, uh, in the early 1990s, correct? That is correct, sir. And Mr. Riotti also had a house in California in the early 1990s. And Brentwood, Brentwood, yes. And you, um, you were working for one of Mr. Riotti's companies in California. That is correct. And I, I know it's been, we've sort of gone back and forth on this, but um, are you able to pin down with any specificity when Mr. Riotti actually moved away from the United States and set up his principal residence in Indonesia.
Mr. Wilson, the, the definition of a the moving, moving away is very, very difficult for me to do. You know, if it's talking about a totally moving out, and for instance, the furniture, everything is going to pack, everything like that. If that's the definition, probably was not done until fairly, fairly, uh, was not too long ago from here. But was his family in the United States in the uh, early 1990s? Let me put it this way. The family enjoyed being in the United States. The kids would love to stay in the United States. Apparently, there was a business situation. They had to spend a lot of time over there to develop the business. Excuse me, let me interrupt. What percentage of the time did the family spend in the United States? OK, I'll be very honest with you on that part. I hope so. Around that period of time, uh, Approximately the most is about three to four months a year. So eight months of the year, the majority of the time they were living in Indonesia. Starting from conservative, you say probably starting from ninety. You know, nineteen ninety. So from nineteen ninety on, the vast majority of his time was spent in Indonesia. It's That's fair. how you determine a permanent residence. So his permanent residence then was... Oh, no. Uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe we have a different way of looking. Talking about, you know, here in the United States, we, 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 we decide, I think, for the most part, people's permanent residence is where they spend the majority of the time. And you're saying that his family was over there probably three-fourths of the time. No, what I'm... The, the two-thirds of time is staying over there physically. When I say the permanent residence, in other words, you get a green card, Holder is supposed to you have a permanent residency. That's why I said a permanent residency. Uh, I'm not saying the definition of the. No, literary. I know he had. A, I know he had a green card, but he, you said that he spent eight months of the year his family did over in Indonesia. That that, that sounds right. Thank you. Family and family. Okay. And and just just to follow up on this because we keep getting it pinned down to sort of about 1990. Um, what was different between 1990 and 1989? I mean. What change did you notice? Why, why, is, why are you saying 1990 and not 1989 or 1988? The, the reason I'm saying this way is that probably at the beginning of a period of time, although he still maintained very heavy travel schedule, but family probably was still staying here. And Mr. Riati himself just going back and forth until later date. Uh, which I, I was saying, conservatively saying, it was around 1990 at that time. But you're telling us today that the family, there was a change of the family status in 1990. I, I believe that's, that's the situation, yes. Just um, shifting a little bit to um, illegal conduct, and, and we discussed extensively uh, 1992 and 1993 and a number of contributions that were reimbursed by uh, LIPO organizations. Um, and you told us very clearly that after, after that conduct, after the 1993 contributions, you didn't do anything else that you thought was illegal. Was that correct? Was it liberal? Uh, at all. I think, Mr. Wilson, you did recall, as there is one contribution in 1995 came in. I think yesterday one of the congressmen mentioned, I said it's about $12,000 some dollars. Yeah. Right. And I, I wanted to sort of hone down on that subject. Um, after 1993, could you list all the, all the uh, activities that you were engaged in that you think might have been illegal, if any? Okay, in 1993, for instance, on a Gore event, we were talking about Chairman Burton was asking about a September event at Gore uh, in Southern California. Uh, there might be another event um, around December. There's some contribution being made. Uh, there were some checks with the Lippo employees. As the Chairman Burton mentioned, you showed me the list yesterday. Was that uh, all the lists you have? I said there may be a few more names that's on that. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, I did say is the period covers 1992, three, four, and possibly on, there's another checks as a five, 95. Okay. 
Okay, well then, let's try and be very specific. After 1994, did you do anything that you now think was illegal? Except, yeah, Mr. Wilson, except the, uh, with the exception of that uh, $12,000 checks, to the best of my knowledge, after the uh, uh, 1994, I left the Lippo. Yeah, now, that would be it. I guess one reason we're interested is because of the underlying facts, and the other is that in your statement yesterday, you had talked about how the Department of Justice thought you'd been candid with them, and we're trying to dis determine whether you've been honest with us. And I wanted to ask you about the contributions that were, um, well, about the, the exchange you had with uh, Mr. Ickes, who was in the White House, right. and, and he had asked you to round up ten to $15,000 for a congressional campaign, and you were at the Department of Commerce, and uh, you told us that you did contact people, and that what you did did benefit the congressman who was asked, you know, asked to be benefited. Um, and, and am I right in, in remembering that you uh, personally collected seven thousand dollars in checks? Mr. Wilson, and I did testify, I did collect $7,000 to Mr. Chairman. And to this day, I, I, I'm not, I'm, 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 I feel very uncomfortable in collecting, do, in that capacity to collect the money. I, I thought I was right in remembering that you right. said you collected $7,000 in checks. And after you collected the checks, you dropped them off personally at the DNC. Is that it was correct? not DNC. Was the Who did you drop them off with? No. I believe in uh, the K Street's address. I thought that was uh, so Jesse Jackson Jr.'s uh, one of our offices uh, over there. That's that's my error. So you you actually collected the money after somebody in the White House had asked you to round up money, and then you took the money to a congressional campaign office and you gave them the money. Is that correct? I drop off the, with the receptions. Yeah, in that office. And, yes. And at that time you were. Uh, working at the Department of Commerce, correct? That is correct, okay. sir. Do you, do you feel that there is a possible violation of law in that?
As I testified yesterday, and uh, I did collect the money, I did not feel comfortable. As of this stage, I, I really don't know, you know about legality. Okay, and um, just one last area in this basic subject, the weary adenata contributions. Um, I think you've said on the record that um, the, the weary adenatas came to your attention through a recommendation of Mr. Riadi. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, now, tell us what you meant by came to your, your uh, attention. Did, did Mr. Riadi call you up and say, there are some people in Arlington or Alexandria or Northern Virginia that can give money? Oh, Mr. Riadi was also in town when Dr. Asini was uh, very sick in the hospital. Uh, remember, I trying to explain to the right. No, I, I do remember yeah. that. But but did Mr. Um, Mr. Riadi say to you, there are some people that can contribute money, and he, he told you their names and and arranged something with? Yes, you? he 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 would say these people can be very helpful to you. And what precisely did he tell you? The. The words I remember is that these people have a legal status, can give, they are able to give. Okay, now, what, one of the most peculiar things about the, the $450,000 that Arif and Soraya Wiriadonata contributed uh, is the fact, and we discussed this yesterday, uh, but there's ultimately a question you've not been asked, the fact that your wife was listed as the solicitor for the money. And, we could look at the, the uh, exhibits again, but no, I, I remember think it's, that, you recall yeah. that your wife was. If I remember correctly, the only time the, my wife's name was listed related to those uh, was a will uh, Dinata's contribution was the first, or uh, maybe a couple of checks, maybe during that period of time. The rest of the times, since I joined the DNC, my wife's name was no longer there. But you do recall, and, and I, I may be wrong on the complete number, but on some of the DNC check tracking forms, your wife was listed as the solicitor of contributions from the Weary Adenatus. Yeah. I've learned that since I saw the documents, yes. Okay, now, that was not correct, you've testified. Is that right? That was not correct. My wife did not solicit those, those uh, contributions, no. Okay. I guess the simple question is, you know, at that time you were working at the Department of Commerce, and if the weary Adenatas had the money to give, and if they were legally entitled to give money, then why would anybody decide to put your wife's name on a check tracking form? Yet, the only thing I know is I believe that Mr. Mercer testified that, you know, that my wife's name was there. Right, but the, the question was, if, if everybody thought that they were entitled to give the money, and they had the money, then, and, and I am asking for your speculation here, but if, if they thought it was their money, and they were allowed to give the money, then why wouldn't somebody just put down an honest answer on the DNC tracking form? Mr. Wilson, I don't know what was nature over there. I did not really fill out. I did not fill out the form. You know, I was not at the DNC. So, did you ever have, did you ever have any conversations with David Mercer about the Weary con, uh, contributions? Uh, they are in the fundraisers. I introduced them together. Yes. And subsequently, has Mr. Mercer ever discussed this subject with you? Uh, 
That's after when? After, well, uh, after your wife's name was put on a check tracking form, did you ever ask him, why did you get my wife involved in this? She didn't give, she didn't do anything. That's not fair to me. I did not know my wife's name was on the list, on the tracking form, until later on I learned from all the news accounts. Okay, just a um, couple of final questions here. Um, did you ever seek any action at the federal level on issues regarding the United States banking industry? And I'll limit that to uh, after 1990. After 1990? Uh, if possible, can you repeat the question? That you, you're shifting your subject to the banking side right now. I, that was a very quick, uh, <laughs> very quick shift. Quick shift, and I'm, I'm sorry for the uh -huh. abrupt nature. Um, shifting to banking. Uh -huh. um, you were involved in the banking industry for a long time. Did you ever seek any type of federal action uh, on issues regarding the United States banking? Could industry? you be a little bit more specific? What do you mean the federal actions means uh -huh. for, for buying or selling or whatever? Did you ever seek any uh, legislative change to any banking provisions after 1990? The only thing I can think of is Hopefully, there will, the banking legislation will pay attention to one of the issues on the Community Reinvestment Act, i.e. the CRA. I did that basically, as I testify, you might have found out, I was the uh, president of the National Association of Chinese American Bankers. The Chinese American Bankers was totally ignored about these issues. Uh, I don't know I should go into the detail or not to you. I think that's one, I, I spend most of the time on that, if you talk about the, the legislative issues on that. And did that, um, did what you were trying to do have any um, impact on the Riyadis or the Lippo Bank or Worthen Bank or any of the Riyadi banking interests? Uh, I don't know there's any impact. Let me say this, the Lippo Bank of California or formerly Bank of Trade was a member of National Association of Chinese American Bankers. Uh, the, the thing I was doing is more or less for the, the overall umbrella for the, all the member banks. And I was not the only one who was doing that. Whoever was the member banks, they were trying to do it collectively. And then also teaming up with the, in, uh, teaming up with the Independence uh, Bankers Association as well. Uh, Mr. Wilson, as you know, most of the Chinese American bankers are not in large size. They're relatively small, but there are six or 7,000 independent bankers in the country. They also uh, are facing a similar issue on the CRA. So at some points, there's a collective effort for National Association of Chinese American Bankers working with uh, uh, Independent Bankers Association. In some form, we did independently on our own for the Chinese American bankers. Let me ask counsel, how, how much more time are you going to need? Five more minutes. Uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that we give the council five more minutes uh, to wrap up without objection, so ordered. This, this time I'll tell you I'm going to change uh, focus fairly quickly here. Um, if, if somebody could find uh, exhibit 354, please. I know I'm shifting focus for you too. Um, we're going to put up on the on the projectors, and if you can look in your books, uh, a wire transfer of one million dollars, uh, which is dated uh, September 18, 1996, from a Tahir account in Jakarta to an account under the name of Tahir at Lippo Bank in California. Sorry, I was, I was sorry, I was distracted. We were looking for the exhibit. Right, exhibit 354. I know it's not a very good copy, but if you could take a look at that, please. And there's a second page as well, so it's not just a single page exhibit. What day was this? <coughs> Um, basically, I, uh, yes, I have those uh, pages. Just, uh, do you have any knowledge of this wire transfer? It's September 1994. 
the simple, I guess the simple question is, do you know of, of a million dollar transfer? No, I do not. To your account. Um, on, on the exhibit, the payable line on the wire transfer uh, says, quote, your good selves, unquote. Uh, do you have any idea what this means? Um, where is it, your good self? Where is that? Which pages is that, uh, Mr. Wilson? There are three but pages. It's, yeah, it's on page two of the exhibit. Okay. And it should be on the middle of the page. Do you have any idea what this what just your just good like self uh, yourself? I think. Um, now, do you know why Mr. Tahir would transfer one million dollars to the U.S. in September of 1996? I don't know. Did you have any discussions with Mr. Tahir uh, about? Um, political contributions that he was going to give in the fall of 1996? No, I did not. Did you discuss with James Riotti any political contributions he was going to give in the fall of 1996? I did not, but the only conversation I had with Mr. Riotti was that Mr. Tahir's daughter has a green card, was able to give, you know, we can invite her for some of the function, and she's she, uh, in fact, in, in early 1996, she gave, but not related to this transaction. So just let me try and get this as accurate as possible. You had a conversation with Mr. Riotti uh, during which you suggested to Mr. Riotti that uh, there was a Tahir child who had a green card in the United States? I did not suggest it. He mentioned to me. He mentioned that to you. Sorry, right. I got that backwards. No, that's, uh, that's early, though, early 1996. Remember, I did the fundraising on February 19, 1996. I believe for that event, uh, Mr. Tahir's daughter or s daughters came over for that event, so there was contribution that sort. Now, that's way early than September. Right. So I have no knowledge about what was going on was in, in September, that million dollar stuff. But just cutting down to the basic line here, Mr. Riotti suggested to you that there was somebody with a green card in the United States who might be able to give money to political campaigns. Is More specific, it would be the daughter, Jane Tahir, for instance. Yeah. So he specifically said Jane Tahir had a green card and could give money. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, now, if you would look at the... Um, If you'd look at the last page of, of exhibit um, three, 354, please, uh, it's the signature card for the account receiving the $1 million uh, wire transfer from Indonesia. Do you recognize either of those signatures? I'm sorry, the last page of 351? Correct. Mr. Wilson, I could not be sure about the signature. There are only about two signatures there. Am I correct? Are you with me on yes, that? Yes, correct. Okay. I definitely don't recognize the first one, number one. Yes. The handwriting on number two looks somewhat familiar. I don't know whether that's Mr. Agus Satiwans or not. Surprisingly, I was going to suggest whether that was Mr. Satiawan. Um, now, you worked with Mr. Satiawan, correct? That's right. So because you, a... uh, you also, committee also refreshed your memory yesterday, showed me uh, one of uh, the hipping holdings, the things. Right. So it just sort of re reminded me on that. So it looks to you, based on what you re recollect and what you saw recently, that that might be Mr. Uh, Satiawan's signature. That possibly, yeah, on that. Um, Mr. 
Mr. Wong, thank you very much. That oh, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to uh, sum up, uh, Mr. Shays? We're about to end our hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank uh, our witness, and I want to thank uh, his two attorneys. Uh, they enabled us to ask our questions, and uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, the candor I think we we got. Um, I, I would say to you, Mr. Wang, uh, you, you are uh, unfortunately living proof of the need for campaign finance reform. For you, that proof came in the form of a, of a felony conviction. For this committee, it comes as a confirmation of the conduit schemes and influence peddling that threaten both our political integrity and, frankly, our national security. For me, your testimony sheds just a little more light into the dark corners of the incessant, corrupting quest for money that pervades every event and all other elements of political campaigns today. The public record is now more complete. It remains my hope that record will serve as the basis for holding offenders accountable and serve as the basis for real campaign finance reform. And uh, I, uh, I make these comments uh, because I really believe that besides holding people accountable, Mr. Chairman, we have got to reform the system. And I know that you have put forward a bill on conduit payments that I think we need to move forward. And I want to say for the record that I know abuses take place in both parties and local governments and state and federal but i really think the administration brought campaign finance abuses to a new art, art form frankly and uh, they haven't wanted to face up to it but i think congress needs to step up to the plate and pass meaningful campaign finance reform legislation and i thank you very much Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, let me just uh, start, uh, end by saying I want to ask uh, unanimous consent to enter an exhibit analyzing the list of fines given out by the Justice Department, which was entered into the record previously by Mr. Waxman, without objection, so order. Just expanding on that. Uh, let me say I appreciate uh, your, your, your patience, uh, and I appreciate Mr. Kinney and Mr. Cobb uh, being uh, so helpful to you in, in, in expediting the answers to the questions. I do want to say, though, that uh, uh, it's still very murky. Uh, millions of dollars in campaign contributions came in from foreign sources. We've, uh, we've, we, we've gotten some information from your three days of testimony, Mr. Wong, but uh, there's still a lot of questions unanswered. Uh, we will continue to try to get to the bottom of all this so that uh, one day we can uh, make sure that no foreign contributions, conduit contributions are legal, number one, are allowed, number two, and number three, that, uh, that those who do that uh, will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The campaigns of the United States of America and the candidates elected in the United States of America should be elected by the people of this country and their campaigns should be funded by the people of this country. Mr. Shays has uh, one opinion on campaign finance laws. I have a little different opinion. I believe there should be full disclosure and uh, hopefully uh, we can get to the legislation he just talked about passed which will eliminate foreign contributions. But in any event, we appreciate your being here. I'm sorry it took three years to get you here. Uh, I hope we don't have to talk to you again. I think uh, we've pretty much completed all the questions we need. But uh, as I said, we will continue to try to get to the bottom of all the campaign finance scandal. Once Mr. again, thank Mr. you for Mr. Chairman, before you hit the gavel, could we just compliment the staff oh, on both yes. sides? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm glad you said that. I wish my staff uh, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I know that you've worked very, very hard, and Mr. Shays knows that the staff has worked very, very hard. Uh, you didn't go home, some of you, for Thanksgiving because you were working. And I know the Democrat side has worked hard as well. So. Thank you very much. You don't get a pay raise, but you do get my congratulations for a job well and done. And I would just like to say that I'm very impressed with the staff. Quality on both sides. This was excellent pre preparation. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas to all. We stand adjourned.
In a moment, the National Association of Manufacturers reviews its key policy issues of 1999. 